Chapter 62 of The Story of Greece, Told to Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. The Last Words of Pericles. When the Spartans marched out of Attica, the country folk left the sheltering walls of Athens to go back to their fields, to dig, to plow, to sow. They hoped in due time to reap a plenteous harvest, for their last year's crops had been destroyed by the enemy. But before the corn was ripe, they knew their hopes were vain. The Spartans had come back, and once again the people were forced to leave their fields and take refuge within the walls of the capital. But in the city itself an enemy appeared, an enemy that worked more dreadful havoc than even the Spartan army. The plague had come to Athens. It spread rapidly, for the people were crowded together, some in sheds, some in tents, and these rough shelters were not kept clean. Squalor and lack of room added to the misery of the sick folk. Thousands of those who had fled for safety to the city were stricken by the plague, and at first few recovered. For fear seized upon those whom the plague spared, and they left the sick untended to die, tortured by thirst and alone. At length, even the Spartans grew afraid, lest upon them too the plague should fall, and they again withdrew from Attica. Then Pericles sailed to Peloponnesus and attacked the enemy in its own country, but with little or no success. But in Thrace, the town of Potidaea, which had been besieged by the Athenians for a year, was forced to surrender. No breach had been made in the walls, but the famine-stricken people could no longer bear the pangs of hunger, nor had they strength left to defend their city. The Athenians allowed the miserable inhabitants to leave Potidaea, but the men were forbidden to take anything with them save one garment, while the women were permitted to take two. Before long, Athenian families were sent to settle in Potidaea, which then became a colony belonging to Athens. During the war, the popularity of Pericles began to wane. It was he who had advised the Athenians to carry on war with the Spartans, and they now accused him of causing all the misery which they had to endure. While he was absent with the fleet in 430 BC, Cleon, the head of those who were opposed to Pericles, tried to make peace with the enemy, but his efforts were in vain. Cleon was determined, if it were possible, to cause the downfall of Pericles. So when he returned to Athens, he accused him of using public money for his own ends. When the public accounts were examined, a small sum was missing, and Pericles was fined by the law courts, but no stain was left on his character. The Athenians were a fickle people. Before long, they forgot their anger, and Pericles found himself as popular as ever. They were even eager to carry on the war with Sparta. Once before, Pericles had been attacked by his enemies. He was accused, along with Phidias the sculptor, of having kept some of the gold which was intended to adorn the statue of Athene in the Parthenon. But it was easy to prove that the charge was false, for the gold had been fixed to the statue in such a way that it could be easily detached. Pericles demanded that this should be done so that the gold might be weighed. His enemies could not refuse the test, so the gold was taken off the statue, weighed, and found to be correct. Against Phidias there were other charges, one being that in the frieze of the Parthenon there were sculptured portraits of himself and Pericles. In 432 BC the great sculptor was thrown into prison, where he died before the day fixed for his trial. The plague, which had disappeared for a year, broke out again in 429 BC with new violence. Pericles had already lost two sons through the terrible scourge. When Peralis, his favorite child, died, he placed a garland upon his body and shut himself in his house to mourn. Nor could he be persuaded afterward to take much interest in the affairs of the state. A year later, he was himself stricken by the plague. He recovered, but was soon after attacked by fever, which he was too weak to resist. As he lay dying, his friends gathered around his bed. Thinking that he did not hear what they said, they began to speak to one another of the great things he had done during his life. But Pericles heard, 
and interrupting them said, What you praise in me is partly the result of good fortune, and, at all events, common to me with many other commanders, what I am most proud of you have not noticed. No Athenian ever put on mourning for an act of mine. These were his last words. Plutarch tells us that Pericles was indeed a character deserving our high admiration, not only for his equitable and mild temper, but also for the high spirit and feeling which made him regard it the noblest of all his honors, that, in the exercise of such immense power, he never had treated any enemy as irreconcilably opposed to him. And it appears to me, says Plutarch, that this one thing gives that otherwise childish and arrogant title a fitting and becoming significance. So dispassionate a temper, a life so pure and unblemished, might well be called Olympian, in accordance with our conceptions of the divine beings to whom, as the natural authors of all good and of nothing evil, we ascribe the rule and government of the world. End of chapter 62. Read by Lisa Gibson, Lincoln, Montana, February 24, 2022. Section 63 of The Story of Greece Told to Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. Chapter 63. The Siege of Plataea. The Peloponnesian War began with an attack upon the little town of Plataea. Two years later, in the early summer of 429 B.C., Plataea was again attacked, this time by the Spartans, who were led by their king, Academus. The town, small though it was, was an Athenian fortress, so the Spartans were eager to raise it to the ground. But Plataea stood on sacred territory, for Pausanias, after his great victory over the Persians, had declared that in time of war it should ever be left undisturbed. The Plataeans reminded the king of the promise of the Spartan general and begged him to withdraw his troops. Academus would not lead his army away, but he promised to do the Plataeans no harm if they would become allies of Sparta, or if they would give up their allegiance with Athens and fight on neither side. But the Plataeans would not agree to either of these plans. Then the king offered to let them leave the town. He promised that their homes, their orchards, their fields would be kept in good order as long as the war lasted, and that they would be given back to them when peace was made. It was a generous offer, and the Plataeans begged to be allowed to send to Athens to ask her advice. Her answer speedily settled the matter. Athens, so ran the message, never deserted her allies, and would not now neglect the Plataeans, but succor them with all her might. Wherefore, the alliance must stand, and the attack of the Spartans be withstood. When Academus heard what Athens had said to the Plataeans, he determined to besiege the town. The Thebans, who were in the Spartan army, rejoiced that war was to begin, for they were ever bitter enemies of the Plataeans. The little town prepared to defend herself against the enemy, sending away the women and children to a place of safety. A hundred women slaves only were kept to cook and wash for the garrison, which was small, yet few in number as they were. The doughty citizens withstood the attacks of the Spartans for two years. When Academus ordered his men to raise a mound as high as the wall around the town, the Plataeans at once added to the height of their defenses. They also dug beneath the mound of the enemy and so undermined it that it was continually sliding down. Then... Lest the wall should be at length be scaled by the enemy, the citizens built an inner wall to protect the city yet more strongly. Often the little garrison looked wistfully for the help that Athens had assured them would be sent, but month after month passed, and no help came from the plague-stricken city, yet the Plataeans did not dream of surrender. Academus was in despair, for he knew that his soldiers were seldom able to take a walled town. His pride was hurt at the thought of being beaten by a mere handful of men. He had with him the whole Peloponnesian army, yet a garrison of five hundred 
had been able to defy all his efforts to capture the city. The king determined, since he could not take the town by assault, to starve it into submission. So he now ordered two great walls to be built round the city, placing on them here and there towers or battlements. The walls were a certain space apart, and this space was covered over so that the soldiers could live in it as in a camp, while armed sentinels paced up and down the roof. When the second year of the siege began, food grew scarce in Plataea. Either the little garrison must force its way out or die of hunger. To escape, the soldiers would have to scale the wall without attracting the attention of the sentinels and reach the ground on the other side. More than half the garrison resolved to stay where it was, but about two hundred determined to make the perilous attempt. So, one cold, dark night in the month of December, when the sentinels had retreated into the towers for shelter, the brave two hundred stole out of the town, carrying ladders on their backs. They wore little clothing that they might climb and run easier that they might step the more quietly their right feet were bare, while on the left each wore a shoe to keep them from slipping in the mud. Stealthily they made their way across a ditch and reached the wall unseen, unheard. Twelve of the bravest scaled the wall and killed the sleepy sentinels who had sought shelter in the towers from a storm of wind and rain. The others then mounted the wall fixed their ladders on the farther side, and reached the ground in safety, while all twelve who had waited to the last began to descend. All would have been well had not one man slipped and knocked a tile off the top of the wall. It rattled and fell to the ground with a noise that roused the Spartans, who scrambled up the wall in great haste, but the darkness was so dense that they could see nothing. Those of the garrison who had stayed in the city did all that they could to perplex the enemy by making a sally on the side of the town farthest from that by which their friends had fled. And when the Spartans lit torches and flashed danger signals to the Thebans, whose city was not far off, the Plataeans lit beacons so that the signals were confused. Meanwhile, the fugitives, having reached the ground in safety, were met by a band of 300 Spartans. These were carrying lights, so that the Plataeans were able to send a shower of arrows among them with sure and deadly aim. In the confusion that followed, all save but one archer succeeded in crossing a ditch covered with ice, but too thin to bear the weight of the fugitives. They struggled through the icy water, and after many narrow escapes, 212 weary men reached Athens in safety. Plataea held out gallantly until the summer of 427 B.C., when famine at length forced her to surrender. Five judges were sent from Sparta to decide the fate of the prisoners, but the trial was a mere form, for the Thebans had already persuaded the Spartans how to treat the unfortunate men. Each prisoner, as he was brought before the judges, was asked if he had helped the Spartans in their war against Athens. As each one answered, no, he was let out and put to death. In this way, two hundred Plataeans and twenty-five Athenians lost their lives, while the city they had so bravely defended was razed to the ground. End of section 63, The Siege of Plataea. Read by Trish Rutter, San Diego, December 30th, 2021. Chapter 64 of The Story of Greece, Told to Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. The Sentence of Death. In the fourth year of the Peloponnesian War, the city of Mytilene, threw off the yoke of Athens. Mytilene was the capital of Lesbos, an island near the coast of Asia. The city had belonged to the Delian League, and when the League became the empire of Athens, the city remained faithful to the empire. But as time passed, the Mytilenians became afraid lest Athens should treat them as she had treated the Samians, 
and should make them subjects instead of allies. While Athens was at war with Sparta, she would have little time, thought the Mytilenians, to trouble about their small island. So they revolted and asked the Spartans to support them if that should be necessary. The Spartans promised to help the Mytilenians if the Athenians should punish their disloyalty. But, as so often happened, they did not attempt to keep their promise until it was too late. Athens was angry when she heard of the revolt at Mytilene. Although she could ill spare the men, she sent an army under a general named Pacchus to blockade the town by sea and by land and so to starve her into submission. At all costs, Mytilene must not fall into the hands of Sparta. Before long, so strict was the blockade, food began to run short in the hapless island, and the Spartans failed to send the help they had promised. But when the citizens were desperate with hunger, a messenger from Sparta reached the town. He had passed the Athenian army unnoticed and had entered Mytilene, to the delight of the starving people. When he assured them that ships laden with corn were on the way and would reach them soon, their joy was unbounded. Day after day, week after week passed, but the Spartan ships did not come, and hope began to die out of the hearts of the Mytilenians. It was plain that they must either surrender or starve to death, so they determined to surrender. They sent for Pacchus and agreed to give up the city and to leave their fate to be decided by the Athenian assembly. In the meantime, about 1,000 of the inhabitants were sent as prisoners to Athens. The Athenians had been bitterly angry with the Mytilenians for revolting when their hands were already full with war at home and with the misery caused by the plague. They were in no mood now to deal mercifully with them. Cleon, a leather merchant who, by his own efforts, had risen to a high position in the state, roused the temper of the people by his rough and noisy eloquence and Pericles was no longer alive to restrain it, as he had so often done, by his wiser, calmer speech. When the assembly met, it was Cleon who proposed that all those able to bear arms should be put to death, and that the women and children should be sold as slaves. In its angry mood, the assembly voted as Cleon wished. No sooner was the sentence of death passed than a ship was dispatched to the island to bid Pacchus, the Athenian general, carry out the terrible decision of the assembly. But a little later, when the assembly broke up and escaped from the influence of Cleon's eloquence, the members began to be ashamed of their cold-blooded sentence. Ambassadors from Mytilene had come to Athens to plead the cause of their people. When they saw that the Athenians were uneasy, they persuaded them to call another meeting of the assembly the following morning to reconsider the sentence that they had passed. Cleon had felt no regret at the fate of the rebels, and he was indignant that the assembly should dream of revoking its decree. When it met on the following day, he spoke even more vehemently than before, urging the members to see that the sentence was carried out. But Diodotus, a noble Athenian, whose name has never been forgotten, spoke as well as Cleon. So wise were his words that those who had already wished to alter the sentence for pity's sake were now sure that wisdom also demanded that the Mytilenians should be spared. Diodotus won the day, for Cleon was defeated by a small majority. No sooner was the sentence revoked than in hot haste a ship was manned and the crew was bidden to do its utmost to overtake the vessel which was carrying the sentence of doom to Mytilene. Already it was twenty-four hours since the ship had left Athens. Was it possible to carry the good news in time? The ambassadors promised large rewards to the oarsmen if they reached the city before the terrible sentence had been carried out. In their anxiety, they provided barley, wine, oil for the crew. 
there was no lack of zeal on the part of the sailors. They rowed with all their strength, taking but scant rest, and eating the barley, which had been soaked in wine and oil and made into cakes, as they sat at their oars. They knew that on their speed depended the life or death of thousands. Swifter and swifter flashed the oars of the second ship. In the first vessel, the sailors pulled slowly, for they were in no haste to deliver the dread tidings which they carried. And it was well that they had no heart for their task, for with every muscle strained to the utmost, the crew of the second boat reached Mytilene only just in time. The death sentence had already reached Pacchus, and he was preparing to carry it out, when, with a glad, triumphant shout, the second boat swung into the harbor, and the Mytileneans were saved. But even so, they paid heavily for their rebellion, for about thirty of their leading citizens were executed. Their fleet was taken by the Athenians, and the walls of their city were destroyed. End of section 64. Read by Annie Laurie Tuttle. Chapter 65 of the Story of Greece, told to boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Greece by Mary MacGregor. Brasidas loses his shield. In 425 BC, the seventh year of the war, an Athenian fleet of about 40 ships, under an admiral named Eurymedon, was forced by stormy weather to seek shelter on the promontory of Pylos in Messenia. Pylos stood on the Bay of Pylos, which you now know as the Bay of Navarino. To give the men something to do until the storm allowed them to sail, Demosthenes, an officer on board one of the ships, made them begin to build a fort. But it was not only to employ the men that he did this, but because he believed that Pylos would make a good fortress from which to attack the western shore of Peloponnesus. At first the men took little interest in the work, for they expected each day to leave Pylos, but as the storm continued, they began to work with a will, and soon a fortress that looked fit to defy an enemy was finished. It had not been easy work, for the men had no iron tools, they could not cut stones, but were forced to pick out those that fitted into each other. When mortar was needed, they had to carry it on their backs, bending forward that it might not fall and clasping their hands behind to help to keep it in place. At length the storm was over, and the fleet sailed away, leaving Demosthenes with five ships to hold the new fortress. Now the entrance to the Bay of Pylos was almost blocked by a narrow, thickly wooded island called Sphacteria. The Spartans soon heard that the Athenians had taken possession of Pylos, which was on their territory. They determined to expel them, and an army under Epidotus was at once sent out and took possession of the wooded island of Sphacteria, while a Spartan fleet sailed into the Bay of Pylos. On board one of the ships was a famous Spartan named Brasidas. Demosthenes had just time to send to Eurymedon to beg him to return with his forty ships. When the Spartans sailed up to the promontory, meaning to attack and capture the fort. But it proved impossible to land. Again and again the Spartan admiral made the attempt but each time he was forced to withdraw, lest his ships should be dashed upon the rocks. Brasidas refused to give in, and he bade his men wreck their vessels rather than be beaten back. Be not sparring of timber, he cried, for the enemy has built a fortress in your country. Perish the ships and force a landing. Spurred on by his words, the men drove their ship upon the beach, while Brasidas stood fearlessly on the gangway, ready to leap upon the shore. But the Athenians saw the bold figure too well, and he became a target for every arrow. As he fell back wounded, his left arm hung helpless over the side of the vessel, and his shield slipped off and fell into the water. The waves washed it towards the shore, whereupon the enemy dashed down to the edge of the water and drew it in triumph up to the beach. After a desperate struggle, the Spartans were forced to withdraw, and the Athenians celebrated their victory by erecting a trophy of their spoils, placing where every eye could see it, the shield of Brasidas. For two days the Spartans still fought to gain the fortress, 
but in vain. On the third day, Eurymedon returned with the Athenian fleet, and as the Spartan ships did not come to meet him, he sailed in at the two entrances to the Bay of Pylos, for the openings had not been secured by the enemy. A desperate battle took place. Many of the Spartan ships were empty, as their crews were on shore. The Athenians tried to drag away these empty vessels, so that the enemy would have no way of escaping from Sphacteria. But the Spartans knew that they must save their vessels at all costs, so they fought with redoubled fury and succeeded in rescuing most of the deserted ships. Yet their efforts proved of little use in the end, for though only five ships were captured, the rest of the fleet was so damaged that the Athenians were left in possession of the bay. They at once began to blockade Epidotas and his army in Sphacteria. End of chapter 65Chapter 66 of the Story of Greece, told to boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Greece by Mary MacGregor The Spartans Surrender When Epitatas found that he was shut up on the island of Sphacteria, he sent a messenger to Sparta to tell what had befallen him. The ephors were so disturbed by his tidings that they at once sent some of their number to the Bay of Pylos to see what could be done to set free Epitatus and his men. They soon saw that it would be too difficult a task to relieve the island, so they begged Eurymedon to grant a truce until they sent ambassadors to Athens to sue for peace. The request was granted, and the Spartan ambassadors at once set sail for Athens. When they entered the assembly, Athens, had she but known it, might have ended the war with honor, but Pericles was no longer there to tell her that to do so would be well. Cleon still ruled the assembly with his rough eloquence. Nicias, the leader of those who desired peace, although he bitterly disliked Cleon, was not strong enough to overthrow him. The assembly, urged by its leader, offered the Spartan ambassadors terms which it knew they would not accept. After rejecting them, as the Athenians expected, the ambassadors returned indignant to Pylos, and the truce was at an end. But Sphacteria was not taken so easily as the Athenians had dreamed. In spite of the strict blockade, food was taken to the island, so that the Spartans were in no danger of starving. Sometimes swimmers carrying with them linseed, poppy seeds, and honey reached the island. Sometimes helots, tempted by promise of freedom, would manage, when the sky was dark and the sea stormy, to sail past the enemy ships taking cheese, meal, and even wine to the Spartans. In Athens, the people were growing impatient of the long blockade. When Demosthenes sent messengers to the city to ask for reinforcements, they began to be sorry that they had not offered more reasonable terms to the ambassadors. They looked darkly at Cleon, and began to whisper that but for his counsel, peace would certainly have been made. A meeting of the assembly was called, and Cleon, losing his temper when Nicias urged that peace should be arranged without delay, said, It would be easy enough to take Sphacteria if our generals were men. If I were general, I would do it at once. Nicias was a quiet man, but these scornful words roused him to anger, and he retorted that if Cleon thought he was able to take the island, it would be well that he should go and do so. He was himself a general, while Cleon was only a leather merchant, but he was willing to resign in his favor. At first Cleon thought that Nicias was but jesting, and he pretended that he really wished to go to the help of Demosthenes. But when he found that his opponent was in earnest, he declined the honor, saying that while Nicias was a general, he himself had no training in military affairs. But the people were not willing to let the leather merchant escape the consequences of his rash words. They shouted that he must go and prove that he could do as he had said. When Cleon saw that there was no escape, he grew reckless, and boasted that he would not only go to Sphacteria, but that he would take the island within twenty days, and either kill all the Spartans on it or bring them prisoners to Athens. Some there were who mocked at his words, others laughed, but all were glad that the merchant should go, for they were tired of his rough ways and rougher speech. If he went, he might return with his promise unfulfilled, and his power with the people would then be lost. If he came back in triumph, the Spartans would have been defeated. Before long, Cleon set out at the head of an army for Pylos. When he arrived, he found Demosthenes already prepared to attack the island. 
A large part of the forest sans bacteria had just been burned down by some Athenian soldiers. They had been sent to the island to reconnoiter, and while making a fire to cook their dinner, the trees were accidentally set alight. The wood had sheltered the Spartans from the enemy, and the fire spoiled their chief defense, so that they were the less prepared to face the army of nearly 14,000 Athenians, which, led by Cleon and Demosthenes, now landed on the island. Outnumbered as the Spartans were, for their army consisted of about 420 soldiers and the same number of helots, they fought bravely as was their custom. But the arrows of the Athenians soon greatly reduced their number, while to add to the distress of the wounded as well as of those who had escaped, the ground over which they marched was hot with still smoldering ashes of burnt wood. At length Epitetus, the Spartan general, was slain, and the few soldiers who were still able to fight retreated to a hill on which was an old ruined fort. Here they took their stand, determined to keep the enemy at bay, and they did so until the Athenians found a path up a steep crag, from the top of which they could command the Spartan fort. Unseen by the brave defenders, the enemy scaled the almost precipitous path, and when they reached the top they at once began to shoot arrows down upon the startled soldiers. But soon Cleon bade them stay their arrows while he sent a herald to the Spartans to bid them surrender. Spartan troops had never yet yielded to a foe. Ever they had conquered or fought to the death. Cleon believed that now, as their brave fellows at Thermopylae had done, they would rather die than yield. But the Spartans dropped their shields and waved their hands above their heads to show that they would cease to fight. They begged to be allowed to ask the advice of their friends on the mainland. The request was granted and their friends bade them to take counsel for themselves, but to do nothing disgraceful. 292 Spartans, who were all that were still alive on Sphacteria, then surrendered. 120 of these belonging to the noblest families in Sparta. Never after this surrender were the Spartans considered invincible. Cleon was now able to return to Athens, which he reached within 20 days from the time he left the city, bringing with him, as he had boasted that he would do, his Spartan prisoners. The Athenians rejoiced at the success of their army, but they laughed as they thought of the strange general who had led it to victory. As for the prisoners, they were glad to hold them as hostages. The Spartans would be less likely to invade Attica while their comrades were in Athens. End of chapter 66《ハプテオスの歴史》の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の And in 424 BC, they marched boldly into the country of Boeotia. At Delium, they seized and fortified a temple, sacred to Apollo. Now, the Boeotians were indignant with the Athenians for invading their land, but they were still more angry that they had dared to enter their temple. They at once marched against the enemy and defeated them with great loss, but the temple was still left in the hands of the Athenians. As was the custom in those days, The defeated generals asked the victors to allow them to bury their comrades who had fallen on the battlefield. But the Boeotians answered, When you give us back our temple, you shall bury your dead. The Athenians refused to do this, saying that Delium, the site on which the temple stood, belonged to Attica, and they had a right to stay in their own land. If you are in your own land, retorted the Boeotians, do as you wish without asking our consent. It was easy to say this. For they knew that the defeated army was not strong enough to defy them. When the invaders still refused to leave the temple, the Boeotians determined to drive them away by setting fire to the wooden barricades with which the Athenians had fortified the temple. So they took a large beam of wood and, scooping out the center, made it into a hollow tube. To one end they fastened, by an iron chain, a huge cauldron. In the cauldron they placed charcoal and sulfur, while to the other end of the tube they tied bellows. By which a strong current of air could be blown through to the other end. When this was done, the charcoal and the sulfur in the cauldron were fanned into a great blaze, and the fortifications of the temple were soon on fire. The Athenians tried to quench the flames in vain, and at length they were forced to flee. 
leaving the temple to the triumphant Boeotians, who no longer refused to let them bury their comrades. The defeat of Delium was followed by many other disasters, and was the beginning of the downfall of the Empire of Athens. Meanwhile, Brasidas had recovered from the wound that he had received at Pylos. Never had there been so strange a Spartan as Brasidas. His countrymen spoke as little as possible, and what they did say they said in a brief, concise manner. In later days such short, pithy speech was termed Lasonic. This name was used because Sparta was also called Lausonia. But Brasidas was not Lasonic. He spoke quickly and with ease, and while his comrades liked to do things in the way their fathers had done, Brasidas loved new ways and bold adventures. Spartans were seldom liked by strangers, for they were rough, often even discourteous in their manner. But Brasidas had winning ways, and wherever he went, he made friends. He was not only pleasant, he was also just, and strangers soon learned that his word could be trusted. This was the man who was now sent with an army through Thessaly. The country was for the most part loyal to Athens, yet the Spartans reached Macedon unhindered. Brasidas had been told that the city of Acanthus was ready to fling open her gates to him, but he found them guarded. He asked to be allowed to enter that he might tell the people why he had come to the city, and they, won by his kind and simple manner, admitted him. His first words pleased them, for he told them that he knew how powerful they were, and that if they refused to throw off their allegiance to Athens, many other cities would be encouraged by their example. If they would trust themselves to Sparta, he promised that their city should be free. But should you refuse, and his voice grew stern, and say that I have no right to force an alliance on a people against its will, I will ravage your land and force you to consent, and for two reasons will I do this. The tribute you pay to Athens injures Sparta by making her foe stronger, and your example will make other cities resist the claims of Sparta. The Acanthians were afraid that Brasidas would fulfill his threat and destroy their fields, and trample on their grapes which are now ripe and ready to pluck, so they determined to trust Sparta and throw off their allegiance to Athens. Brasidas was pleased, for, as he had foreseen, other cities quickly followed the example of Acanthus. Encouraged by his success, the Spartan general now determined to attack Amphipolis, an important town on Thrace, standing on the bank of the river Strymon. End of chapter 67 Chapter 68 of the Story of Greece Told to Boys and Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Greece by Mary MacGregor Amphipolis Surrenders to Brasidas Amphipolis belonged to the Athenians, who had sent Thucydides and Euclides to guard the city lest it should be attacked by the Spartans. Thucydides had not only the city, but a large district also to protect, and he was at this time stationed with his troops at some distance from Amphipolis, while Euclides was in the city itself. The bridge over the Strymon, which led to the city, was carelessly guarded, so when, on a cold and wintry day, Brasidas reached the river, he took the bridge without difficulty, making prisoners the few soldiers who held it. Messengers were at once sent to Thucydides to tell him that the Spartans had seized the bridge, and to beg him to come as quickly as possible to protect the city. Before the day was over, Thucydides had reached Eon, at the mouth of the Strymon, but his speed was of no avail, for Amphipolis had already surrendered, tempted by the easy terms that Brasidas had offered. When the Athenians heard that the city was lost, they were indignant with Thucydides, and chiefly through the influence of Cleon, who disliked him, he was sent into exile. The punishment was severe, but Thucydides was not idle during his banishment. He traveled from place to place, and everywhere he went he paid great attention to the ways of the people and to the manner in which their cities were governed. He himself wrote, associating with both sides, with the Peloponnesians quite as much as with the Athenians, because of my exile. I was thus enabled to watch quietly the course of events. After having studied the course of events, Thucydides began to write about the Peloponnesian War, and he became the greatest of all the historians of Greece. After the surrender of Amphipolis in 424 BC, 
City after city forsook its allegiance to Athens. Sion did not even wait for the Spartans to demand a mission. They opened their gates and begged Brasidas to enter. His presence pleased the people well, and when he had spoken to them their enthusiasm knew no bounds. They sent for a crown of gold and placed it on his head, calling him the Liberator of Hellas. Many of the people, too, cast garlands over him as they were used to do to victors at a race. Until now, Brasidas had fought loyalty for the sake of his country, but after the crown of gold had rested upon his head, he grew more ambitious to win fame for himself than glory for his country. It was his ambition that made him now do all that he could to keep Sparta from making peace with Athens, as she wished to do. Cleon, too, was eager that the war should continue, not in order to win renown for himself, but rather that Athens might regain the empire that Brasidas was snatching from her grasp. Two years after the surrender of Amphipolis, Cleon urged the Athenians to make an effort to retake the city. His rough eloquence persuaded them to undertake the task. He was himself appointed general and was sent to Thrace at the head of a large army. As he marched through the country, he took several towns before he reached Eon, at the mouth of the river Strymon. Here he halted, meaning to wait for reinforcements, but his soldiers had little respect for their general. Was he not, after all, only a leather merchant? What could he know about war? And they clamored to be led at once against the enemy. Cleon did not dare to refuse to do as his army wished, and he ordered his whole force to march toward Amphipolis to find out the strength of the enemy. Brasidas was encamped with his army on the top of a hill, near to the city, from which he could watch every movement of the enemy. When he saw the Athenians approaching, he ordered his men to march into the town, where the Spartan Cleridus was now governor. Cleon at once supposed that Brasidas had taken shelter within the walls of Amphipolis so as to avoid a battle. Feeling no longer anxious, he left his army near the city, but not drawn up ready for battle, and himself rode carelessly forward to look at the surrounding country. Meanwhile, some Athenian soldiers heard the restless movement of men and horses within the walls. Others looking under the gates saw many feet gathering together. It was clear that preparations were being made by the Spartans to sally out and attack them. A messenger was sent in haste to find Cleon. The general no sooner heard the report than he hurried back to his army and commanded it at once to retreat towards Eon. To do this, the Athenians had to march past Amphipolis with their right sides unprotected, for their shields were carried always on their left arm, which was now the farthest from the walls of the city. The men had no confidence in the general and began to retreat in disorder. From within the city, Brasidas was watching with keen eyes the movements of the enemy. Suddenly he cried, These men will never withstand our onset. Look at their quivering spears and nodding heads. Men who are going to fight never march in such a fashion as this. Open the gates at once, that I may rush on them forthwith. So the gates of the city were flung open and out dashed Brasidas, followed by his men. As he charged right into the center of the Athenian army, the left wing, Seized with panic, fled. Cleridas, meanwhile, led a body of men against the right wing, and a fierce struggle followed. Cleon, less at home on a battlefield than in the assembly at Athens, grew frightened at the unusual sights and sounds, and fled, leaving his army without a leader. As he fled, an arrow pierced him, and he fell to the ground, wounded to death. Brasidas also, as he turned to go to the help of Cleridas, was wounded. His followers carried him within the walls of the city. He lived long enough to know that the Athenians were utterly defeated. The people of Amphipolis had learned to love Brasidas, and he was buried with great splendor in the marketplace. A temple was built to his honor, and every year sacrifices were offered and games were held in memory of the brave soldier. So deep was the affection of the people that they determined to forget that their city had been founded by an Athenian, and henceforth to count Brasidas the Spartan, the true founder of Amphipolis. As Cleon and Brasidas were both dead, the peace party, with Nicias at its head, was able to arrange terms with the king of Sparta, and in spring, 421 BC, the peace of Nicias was signed, the first part of the Peloponnesian War, which had begun ten years before, was ended. End of chapter 68 Section 69 of The Story of Greece Told to Boys and Girls. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Heather Eney, The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. Alcibiades, the favorite of Athens. The peace of Nicias, which was made for fifty years, did not last more than six. Thucydides tells us that it did not really last even so long. For although for six years neither Spartans nor Athenians invaded each other's land, yet they did as much harm as they could to one another. So that, says the wise historian, if any one objects to consider it a time of war, he will not be estimating it rightly almost as soon as peace was signed sparta and the state of argos quarrelled each wished to get help from athens so each sent ambassadors to her the argives boldly begged athens to join them against sparta the spartans were content to remind her that she had signed the peace of nicias in athens at this time there was a rich young noble named alcibiades who wished the athenians to make an alliance with the argives but the spartan ambassadors had already been welcomed by the athenians because they had come with full power to arrange fair terms alcibiades was as determined as he was angry to gain what he wished he resolved to play a trick on the spartan ambassadors so he went to them in secret and told them how foolish they had been to tell the athenians what great powers they had for the assembly would certainly wrest from them more than they wished to give when the assembly meets tell the people said alcibiades that you have no power but that you will send their demands to the spartan council i will support you and all will be well for you will have time to think over their wishes the ambassadors thought that the young noble knew better than they how his countrymen should be treated and they promised to follow his advice so when the assembly met the next day the spartans declared that they had come only to report what the athenians should say that they had no power to arrange terms until they had heard from their own council no sooner had they spoken than alcibiades jumped to his feet and to the dismay of the ambassadors he pointed to them with scorn saying these men say one thing one day and another thing the next day they are not to be trusted let us refuse to have anything more to do with them the athenians at once agreed with alcibiades that it was useless to treat with such unreliable ambassadors and they then made an alliance with the argives when the spartans reached their own country they told how they had been deceived by alcibiades and how rudely they had been treated by the assembly and this as well as the alliance which the athenians had made with the argives was the cause of the second part of the peloponnesian war the spartans were thirsting to avenge the battle of sphacteria and to wipe the memory of their surrender when they met the athenians in four eighteen b c at mantinea they fought with the courage and the fierceness that had made them invincible until the fatal day of sphacteria alcibiades whose trick had been the cause of so much mischief was the son of an athenian named clinias while alcibiades was still young his father died and pericles became one of his guardians he was a beautiful baby a handsome boy and when he grew to be a man he was so brave and so winning in his ways that he made friends very easily but he made enemies as well as friends for he was wild and wayward while his pride often made him behave with scant courtesy even to those whom he should have treated with reverence and respect staid sensible folk were shocked at his careless extravagant ways nicias distrusted him but the citizens loved him and forgave him much for he spent his wealth freely among them and often entertained them with public shows they love and hate and cannot do without him wrote aristophanes as he watched the athenians now cherishing now chiding their favorite 
one day he was a mere lad at the time he was wrestling with a playmate when thinking he was going to be thrown he suddenly bit his companion's hand with all his strength his friend quickly let go his hold crying you bite alcibiades like a woman no answered the boy like a lion another day he was throwing dice in the street with his playmates when a wagon pulled by two horses approached it was the turn of alcibiades to throw and he shouted to the driver to stop but the man paid no heed to the boy and drove on the other children scampered out of the way but the wilful little noble flung himself down in front of the horses and cried to the driver to go on now if he pleased afraid lest he should hurt the boy the man at once pulled up his horses while those who had been looking on in terror rushed forward and dragged the foolish little fellow out of danger but alcibiades had made the driver pull up and he was content his want of self-control became greater as he grew older when he was at a grammar school he one day asked the schoolmaster to lend him one of homer's books the master said that he did not possess it whereupon the rude boy struck him and then turned and walked away some years later he struck a citizen whose talent in the theatre had outshone his own when he was a young man he walked into the assembly with a pet quail hidden under his cloak this would have raised a storm of indignation had it been done by any one else in the law court one of alcibiades friends was accused when the favorite at once seized the writ and tore it in pieces before the face of the judge the young nobleman was rich and much of his wealth he spent on horses he sent seven chariots to the olympic games and once to the great delight of the athenians their favorite won the first second and third prizes euripides the poet sang of the triumph of alcibiades in these lines but my song to you son of cleneus is due victory is noble how much more to do as never greek before to obtain in the great chariot race the first the second and third place with easy step advanced to fame to bid the herald three times claim the olive for one victor's name at one time alcibiades owned a very large handsome dog for which he paid an enormous price he ordered his tail which plutarch tells us was his principal ornament to be cut off his friends said that it was a stupid deed and told him that every one in athens was angry that he had spoiled the noble appearance of his dog but alcibiades only laughed saying just what i wanted has happened then i wished the athenians to talk about this that they might not say something worse of me it was natural so reckless and generous a youth should be surrounded by a crowd of flatterers ready to applaud his foolish and sometimes insolent acts but alcibiades had no love for these careless admirers although he would spend hours with them at feasts and revels his affection he gave to one whom you would scarcely have expected the gay young nobleman to notice to socrates the great philosopher and teacher of Athens. End of section 69。section 70 of the story of Greece told to boys and girls。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer、please visit LibriVox.org。read by heather eney the story of greece by mary mcgregor socrates the philosopher socrates was born in 469 b c he was not a noble like alcibiades but a man of humble birth nor was he handsome as was his disciple but plain even ugly the people said he was small too and dressed with little care if any one wished to find the philosopher he knew that he had only to go to the market-place or into the streets here from early morning until late at night socrates was to be seen and always he was talking talking to all those who were willing to listen 
and there were ever many who were not only willing but eager to hear what the teacher had to say for his words were so wise his conversations so strange socrates believed that the gods had sent him to teach the athenians from his boyhood he had heard a voice within him bidding him to do this not to do that he often spoke of this voice to those who became his disciples it became known as the demon of socrates the philosopher was a soldier as well as a teacher and his philosophy taught him how to endure hardship as well as or even better than could the ordinary athenian in heat or in cold he wore the same clothing and in all weathers he walked with bare feet he ate little and drank less whether he was in the camp or in the city xanthippe the wife of socrates had not a good temper and she would often scold the philosopher that may have been because while he was teaching wisdom in the marketplace xanthippe was at home wondering how to provide food for her husband and their children with the few coins she possessed socrates was never paid by his disciples and it so often happened that xanthippe found it difficult to get food and clothing for her household the philosopher taught for many years but at length in three ninety nine b c his enemies accused him of speaking against the gods of athens he had even dared so they said to speak of new gods whom the people should worship and that was a crime worthy of death socrates took little trouble to defend himself against the accusations of his enemies his demon he said would not allow him to plead for his life so he was condemned to death but only by a majority of five or six votes out of six hundred for thirty days socrates was in prison and he spent the time in talking to his friends just as he had been used to do in the marketplace one of his disciples named crito bribed the jailer to allow his prisoner to escape but socrates refused to flee he did not fear death but faced it calmly as he had faced life on the day before the sentence was carried out he talked quietly to his disciples of the life to which he was going for he believed that his soul which was his real self would live after he had laid aside his body as a garment when the cup of hemlock a poisoned draught was brought to him his friends wept but he took the cup in his hand and drank the contents as though it were a draught of wine his last words to crito were to remind him to pay a debt crito we owe a cock to asclepius he said discharge the debt and by no means omit it asclepius was the god of medicine and in this way socrates showed his reverence for the religious customs of his country this was the man who found in alcibiades despite his wild ways a noble mind and a kind heart these he determined to educate and his pupil was quick to see that socrates spoke truth to him he soon learned to appreciate his kindness and to stand in awe of his virtue sometimes indeed the words of his master overcame him so much as to draw tears from his eyes and to disturb his very soul so dear did the philosopher become to alcibiades that he often lived in the same tent with him and shared his simple meals yet sometimes he was tempted by his flatterers when they begged him to come and spend the days in pleasure and the nights in feasting then he would yield to their entreaties and for a while desert and even avoid his master but the philosopher did not leave his pupil unchecked to do as he wished he would pursue him as if he had been a fugitive slave he reduced and corrected him by his addresses and made him humble and modest by showing him in how many things he was deficient and how very far from perfection in virtue End of section 70
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Heather Eney. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. Alcibiades Praises Socrates. One of the most famous disciples of Socrates was Plato. He loved his master well and wrote down many of his conversations so that his words may still be read. In a book named The Symposium, Plato tells us that Socrates and his friends met at a banquet one day and spoke to each other in praise of love. When it came to Alcibiades' turn to speak, he was eager to tell of the love he had for Socrates. He began by begging the others not to laugh if he said first of all that Socrates was like the images of the god Silenus, which they had often seen in the shops of Athens. Now, Silenus was a satyr, a strange figure that was half man, half goat. In his mouth were pipes and flutes upon which he played, while his images were made to open, and within each might be seen the figure of a god. As the gay company thought of the uncouth figure of the satyr at which they had often stared in shop windows, they could not but laugh at Alcibiades for comparing his master to such an image. But when the young nobleman went on to speak of the god that was hidden in Socrates, just as the image of one was concealed in the body of the satyr, it may be that the laughter of the gay company was hushed. For in truth the disciple could say no greater thing about the master he loved than this, that within him he bore the likeness of a god. But Silenus was not the only satyr that reminded Alcibiades of his master. Marcius, a wonderful flute player, also made him think of Socrates. For, said Alcibiades, are you not a flute player, Socrates? That you are and a far more wonderful performer than Marcius. He, indeed, with instruments used to charm the souls of men by the power of his breath. But you produce the same effect with your voice only, and do not require the flute. That is the difference between you and him. Pericles and other great Athenian orators, Alcibiades had heard, he said unmoved, while Socrates' words, even at second hand and however imperfectly repeated, amaze and possess the souls of every man, woman, and child who comes within hearing of them. Alcibiades then told his astonished listeners how his master's eloquence held him as with chains of gold. This Marcius, he says, has often brought me to such a pass that I have felt as if I could hardly endure the life which I am leading, and I am conscious that if I did not shut my ears against him and fly from the voice of the siren, he would detain me until I grew old sitting at his feet. For he makes me confess that I ought not to live as I do, neglecting the wants of my own soul and busying myself with the concerns of the Athenians. Therefore I hold my ears and tear myself away from him. So greatly did the words of Socrates disturb Alcibiades that sometimes he even wished his master were dead and could trouble him no more. And yet I know, he adds quickly, that I should be much more sorry than glad if he were to die, so that I am at my wit's end. But it was not only his master's eloquence that Alcibiades praised before the gay company of revelers, it was his deeds as well. During the Peloponnesian War, both Socrates and Alcibiades were present at the siege of Potidaea. There we messed together, said Alcibiades, and I had the opportunity of absorbing his extraordinary power of sustaining fatigue and going without food. In the faculty of endurance he was superior, not only to me, but to everybody. There was no one to be compared to him, yet at a festival he was the only person who had any real power of enjoyment. Cold, too, Alcibiades said, Socrates could bear without flinching. The winter at Potidaea was severe, the frost intense. The Athenian soldiers stayed indoors when they could. When they were forced to be out, they put on as many extra clothes as they could find. Their feet they swathed in felt and fleeces. 
But Socrates, with his bare feet on the ice and in his ordinary dress, marched better than the other soldiers who had shoes, and they looked daggers at him because he seemed to despise them. Yet another tale of his endurance Alcibiades told the listening company. One morning, he said, Socrates was thinking about something which he could not resolve. He would not give it up, but continued thinking from early dawn until noon. There he stood, fixed in thought. And at noon attention was drawn to him, and the rumor ran through the wondering crowd that Socrates had been standing and thinking about something ever since the break of day. At last, in the evening after supper, some Ionians, out of curiosity, it was now summer, brought out their mats and slept in the open air that they might watch him and see whether he would stand all night. There he stood all night until the following morning, and with the return of light he offered up a prayer to the sun and went his way. Not even yet had Alcibiades exhausted the praises of his master, and the gay company listened spellbound and bewildered to the young noble. They had not guessed how well he loved, how gravely he had studied the words and ways of Socrates. Now it was the courage of his master that he wished to tell, for Socrates had saved his life in battle. This was, said Alcibiades, the engagement in which I received the prize of valor. For I was wounded and he would not leave me, but he rescued me and my arms. And he ought to have received the prize of valor which the generals wanted to confer on me, partly on account of my rank, and I told them so. This Socrates will not impeach or deny, but he was more eager than the general that I and not he should have the prize. When the Athenians fled after the defeat of Delium, the young nobleman was on horseback, and being himself safe, he watched Socrates, who was among the foot soldiers. There you might see him, said Alcibiades, just as he is in the streets of Athens stalking like a pelican and rolling his eyes, calmly contemplating enemies as well as friends, and making very intelligible to anyone even from a distance that whoever attacked him would be likely to meet with a stout resistance. And in this way he and his companions escaped. With one more tribute to his master, Alcibiades ended his discourse on love. His absolute unlikeness to any human being that is or ever has been is perfectly astonishing. His are the only words which have a meaning in them and also the most divine, extending to the whole duty of a good and honorable man. This, friends, is my praise of Socrates. You will be glad to know that Socrates valued the love of his disciple and returned it. I only love you, said the philosopher, whereas other men love what belongs to you. And your beauty, which is not you, is fading away, just as your true self is beginning to bloom. And I will never desert you if you are not spoiled and deformed by the Athenian people. For the danger which I most fear is that you will become a lover of the people and will be spoiled by them. Many a noble Athenian has been ruined in this way. End of section 71. Chapter 72 of the Story of Greece, told to boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lucy Monson Lemaire. The Story of Greece by Mary MacGregor The images of Hermes are destroyed. In the island of Sicily, there were many different states. In some of these dwelt Greeks who owned Corinth as their mother city. Trade between Sicily and Corinth was good, and because of this, Corinth was growing more powerful than Athens liked. War broke out in 416 BC between Segesta and Selinus, two cities in the west of Sicily. When Selinus was joined by another town named Syracuse, the Segestans in dismay sent to the Athenians to ask for their help. 
it had long been the ambition of alcibiades to conquer sicily he believed too that it would add to the glory of athens if the island became part of the athenian empire so he now urged the assembly to send a fleet to sicily reminding them that if it could conquer syracuse it would then be in its power to ruin the trade of corinth with sicily he did not tell the athenians how great his ambitions were but he told them enough to make them wish to help the suggestions that they might in this way gain new territory for athens the assembly made up its mind to send ambassadors to Sagesta to find out if the town was able, as she said she was, to provide money to carry on the war if the Athenians provided soldiers. When the ambassadors returned in the spring of 415 BC, they brought back with them a sum of money from the grateful Sagestans. They reported, too, that the wealth of the city was far greater than they had dreamed, but although the ambassadors did not know until too late, they had been deceived by the townsfolk, for the rich plate and splendid ornaments with which the suggestions had adorned each feast to which the ambassadors had been invited were taken secretly from house to house, so that the gold and silver dishes that dazzled the eyes of the Athenians were always the same, although they believed that each of their hosts owned the splendid dishes with which his table was laden the sacred treasures of their temples too the suggestions pretended were of gold while in reality they were of silver but the ambassadors were convinced that the people they had visited were rich and their report made the athenians ready to do as alcibiades and his party wished so it was agreed that sixty vessels should be sent to the help of Sagesta. nicias bent as ever on peace did all he could to hinder the expedition but when in spite of all he could say the assembly still determined to send a fleet to sicily he persuaded it at least to increase the number of ships from sixty to a hundred nicias himself along with lamachus and alcibiades was appointed commander of the expedition but the night before the fleet was to sail a strange event took place all over the city at the corner of streets in some niche of a public building in front of the houses of the citizens stood statues or busts of the god hermes on short pedestals or pillars these figures were reverenced by the athenians just as the image of the madonna by the roadside or in villages and towns abroad is worshipped by roman catholics on the night before the expedition the statues of hermes were chipped and broken so that the god could no longer be recognized in the morning as the athenians went along the streets of the city bent on their usual business these poor defaced images stood them in the face little groups gathered at street corners before public buildings wherever they had been used to see the statues of hermes at first they gazed at their mutilated god in fear but fear soon changed to anger who had dared to do this impious thing they asked one another it would surely bring down the wrath of the gods on the sicilian expedition it was perhaps natural that the people should suspect their favorite alcibiades was he not often reckless and ever a mischief maker they were too excited to remember that he was not likely to do anything to delay the expedition on which his heart was set when he heard that the people thought that he had defaced the images alcibiades demanded to be brought to trial but no proof had yet been found of his guilt, and it was decided that the fleet should sail and that Alcibiades should go with it. End of chapter 72「Chapter 73 of the Story of Greece, told to boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lucy Monsen Lamar. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. Alcibiades escapes to Sparta. A great crowd gathered at the Piraeus to see the fleet set sail for Sicily. Groups clustered together, talking eagerly of the new empire that was to be won in the West, and the glory that Athens would gain from her conquests it was a noisy happy crowd suddenly the heralds called for silence and the hush fell upon the light-hearted folk as the priests prayed to the gods for the success of the expedition sacrifices too 
were offered by officers and sailors alike then to the strain of a hymn in which the crowd of onlookers joined the anchors were raised and the fleet sailed slowly away when the ships reached sicily each commander had a different plan to propose nicias having learned how the ambassadors had been deceived wished to sail homewards without helping the suggestions lamachus a brave blunt soldier wished to sail at once to syracuse and take the city by a sudden attack alcibiades proposed that they should do nothing until they had made allies of the cities that were not friendly to syracuse and to this plan the other commanders at length agreed meanwhile two ships from athens had followed alcibiades to sicily for the assembly had determined to arrest him and bring him home to be tried for the destruction of the images of hermes alcibiades went quietly on board one of the ships but he knew that if he went back to athens he would be condemned to death so daring a deed as the spoiling of their god was more than the athenians could forgive even to their favourite and there were many who believed he was guilty so when the ship reached a seaport town in italy alcibiades slipped on shore and escaped from his enemies in his absence the athenians condemned him to death and confiscated his property while the curses of the gods were called down upon his head alcibiades was very angry when he heard what his countrymen had done and in his wrath he cried i will make them feel that i am alive and he fulfilled his threat for he went at once to the spartans the enemies of his own country and told them the plans of the athenian generals he bade them send a clever general named gylippus with an army to syracuse to help the city to withstand the attacks of the athenians he also advised them to build a fort at Decelia, the town in attica and to send troops there to harass the athenians as much as possible to betray his country in this way would have been an unworthy deed for any athenian it was the more unworthy in alcibiades because he had learned from socrates the true meaning of honour and righteousness the spartans were eager to profit by the advice of the traitor and they saw for themselves the wisdom of his words but in their hearts they did not trust the man who had betrayed his country alcibiades stayed in sparta for some time and while he was there he tried to win the confidence of the people by doing as they did people who saw him wearing his hair-cut clothes bathing in cold water eating coarse meal and dining on black broth doubted or rather could not believe that he had ever had a cook in his house or had ever seen a perfumer or had worn a mantle of purple it was said that alcibiades was like a chameleon because just as it can change its colour as it chooses so could the athenian change his dress and his costumes as he wrote end of chapter seventy three chapter seventy four of the story of greece told to boys and girls this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lucy Manson Lamer. The Story of Greece by Mary MacGregor. The Siege of Syracuse. Nicias and Lamachus now determined to attack Syracuse without delay. They succeeded in seizing the high ground which joined the town to the mainland of Sicily. Across this ground they began to build a wall, meaning to cut the Syracusans off from help by land. The Athenian fleet then sailed into the harbour of Syracuse, so that no help might reach the city by sea. But before the war was finished, two things had happened to frustrate the plans of the Athenians. The Syracusans did not mean to let the enemy finish the war if they could prevent it, so they sailed out of the city to drive them away. In the struggle which followed, Lemachus was killed, and Nicias was left alone to carry on the siege but what was perhaps even worse for the athenians than the death of their general was the arrival of gylippus the spartan commander almost before the athenians were aware gylippus at the head of his troops marched into syracuse nor did he rest until he had driven them from the hill on which they were encamped and forced them to take up their position close to the harbour 
Nicias was ill, and his illness made him more hopeless than perhaps he would otherwise have been. He wrote to the assembly to tell it that the Spartans had wrested from the Athenians all that they had gained, and that they were now themselves in danger of being besieged. The fleet, he said, had been drawn up on the beach for months, and would have to be repaired before it was seaworthy. Even then it would be difficult to man the vessels, for many of the crew had died and many more were out of practice. So faint of heart was the Athenian general that, at the end of his gloomy report, he urged that the whole enterprise should be given up, or if not, that at least a new fleet might be sent out without loss of time. For himself he begged that he might be recalled, as he was ill and unfit for his duties. The assembly refused this last request, but it sent a new fleet to his help, commanded by Eurymedon and Demosthenes. Meanwhile, Gylippus was not idle. He attacked the Athenians both by land and sea. By land he was victorious, but at sea he was defeated. Undaunted, he at once ordered that the bows of the Spartan vessels should be made heavier and shorter. When this had been done, he again attacked the enemy's fleet and when the battle ended, Gylippus held the entrance to the harbour. The Athenians were now in great peril, for they were besieged both by land and sea. They could not leave the harbour unless they cut their way through the fleet of the victorious Syracusans, and this they had no courage to attempt. But on the day after the battle which had seemed to seal their fate, hope awoke once more in the Athenian ranks, for the new fleet, under Eurymedon and Demosthenes, came in sight. The new commanders at once determined that the hill above Syracuse must be retaken, so on a moonlight night the attempt was made. But although a band of Athenians gained the hill, took a fort and repulsed six hundred of the enemy, they were soon afterwards put to flight. Many of the soldiers flung away their shields, as they were driven down the hill, and fell over the cliffs. Others were pushed back upon their comrades, who were still climbing upwards so that soon the whole army was in confusion. This disaster crushed the spirit of the Athenians. Many of the soldiers, too, had fever caused by the marshy ground on which their camp was pitched. Many more were ill or wounded. Eurymedon and Demosthenes advised Nicias to order the whole army to sail away before the entrance to the great harbour was entirely blockaded, but to this he would not consent. It seemed that he was afraid to return to Athens to tell that the expedition had failed. Demosthenes then urged Nicias at least to leave the harbour and sail to a point where their supplies could not be stopped by the enemy. This, too, Nicias refused to do. But soon after his refusal, large reinforcements reached the Spartans, and the general's obstinacy gave way. He ordered the fleet to prepare to leave the harbour. The men were glad to desert their unhealthy quarters and got ready in haste, but secretly, that the Syracusans might not suspect their plans. All was ready when, on the 27th of August, 413 BC, the night before the fleet was to sail, an eclipse of the moon took place. Nicias was filled with superstitious fears. What might the eclipse not portend? He sent to the soothsayers who said that the fleet must on no account leave the harbour for twenty-seven days. To disobey the oracle would be fatal, so Nicias believed, and he at once forbade the fleet to sail until twenty-seven days had passed. End of chapter 74「Chapter 75 of the Story of Greece told to boys and girls – this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Greece by Mary MacGregor. The Athenian Army is Destroyed. The Athenians made their preparations to retreat as secretly as possible, but the Syracusans soon discovered their plans. When they heard that their departure was delayed for twenty-seven days, they determined to attack the Athenian fleet once more, and again they were successful. On the land the Athenians repulsed Gylippus, 
but they gained little by this success, for the Syracusans had made up their mind that the whole Athenian army should be destroyed. So, as Demosthenes had foreseen, they barricaded the entrance to the great harbour, drawing their ships across it, and lashing them together with chains. Nicias saw that a battle must be fought, and he ordered a great number of the land troops to go on board the fleet. At all costs, he must strengthen his navy. The first thing the Athenians had to do was to break through the ships that were lashed together at the mouth of the harbour. But before the chains could be broken, the enemy was upon them, surrounding them on every side. Despair gave the Athenians courage, and so desperately did they fight that for a time it seemed that they might yet escape. Above the crash of vessels rose the cheers or groans of those who watched the battle from the shore. Thucydides gives us a picture of the hopes and fears, the triumph and despair of those who fought as of those who watched. He says, quote, the fortune of the battle varied, and it was not possible that the spectators on the shore should all receive the same impression of it. Being quite close, and having different points of view, they would some of them see their own ships victorious, their courage would then revive, and they would earnestly call upon the gods not to take from them their hope of deliverance. But others, who saw their ships worsted, cried and shrieked aloud, and were, by the sight alone, more utterly unnerved than the defeated combatants themselves. Others again, who had fixed their gaze on some part of the struggle which was undecided, were in a state of excitement still more terrible. They kept swaying their bodies to and fro in an agony of hope and fear, as the stubborn conflict went on and on. For at every instant they were all but saved or all but lost and while the strife hung in the balance, you might hear in the Athenian army at once lamentation, shouting, cries of victory or defeat, and all the various sounds which are wrung from a great host in extremity of danger. At length the Athenians were pushed back and yet further back, until the fleet was stranded on the shore. The soldiers who had been left on land now rushed forward and succeeded in saving sixty of their ships from the enemy. Demosthenes urged the men to embark and try once again to cut their way out of the harbour, but they refused, so crushed were they by their defeat. To retreat by land was all that the Athenians could now try to do, yet in their hearts they knew that the retreat must end in slavery or in death. The sick and the wounded were left behind, but those who were stricken with fever, caused by the marshland on which they had been encamped, clung to their comrades, and scarce knowing what they did, begged that they might not be left behind. But their strength soon failed, and they sank down by the wayside to die. Nicias, ill as he was, did all in his power to encourage and cheer his men. He himself led the van, Demosthenes brought up the rear. After marching for several days, the Athenians were parched with thirst. When at length they reached a stream, it was to find the enemy awaiting them on the farther bank. But their thirst was intolerable, and paying no heed to the foe, the soldiers rushed to the water. As they stooped to drink, the Syracusans fell upon them and put them to death. Demosthenes and his men had fallen behind the rest of the army, and had already been forced to surrender. Nicias now saw that he, too, must submit to Gylippus. Seven thousand prisoners were sent by the Spartans to work in stone quarries. These quarries were like dungeons, but they were open to the sky, and during the day the scorching sun beat down piteously on the miserable prisoners, while at night the cold was so intense that sleep was impossible. Here they were kept for seventy days, with only enough food to keep them alive, and with scarcely any water to drink. Many of the men died, those who survived were sold as slaves. Nicias and Demosthenes were both put to death. It is said that they were tortured, although Gylippus did all he could to save them from the angry Syracusans. 
thus in disaster and defeat ended the expedition that sailed forth so bravely from athens two years before thucydides says that this expedition was quote, the greatest adventure that the greeks entered into during this war and in my opinion he adds the greatest in which the greeks were ever concerned the one most splendid for the conquerors and most disastrous for the conquered for they suffered no common defeat but were absolutely annihilated land army fleet and all and of many thousands only a handful ever returned home End quote. End of chapter seventy five section seventy six of the story of greece told the boys and girls this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by jared shaw the story of greece by mary mcgregor alcibiades returns to athens Alcibiades fled from the Athenians to Sparta, but he did not stay there long, for he soon grew tired of living as simply and frugally as the people of that country. He had, too, made an enemy of one of the kings of Sparta, so in the autumn of 412 BC he fled to Miletus in Asia Minor, where Tissaphernes, the Persian governor, ruled for the great king Tissaphernes was a cruel man, but he was easily pleased by flattery. Alcibiades soon discovered the governor's weakness, and he determined to win his favor by his agreeable speeches. He succeeded so well that the Persian named some of his parks and pavilions Alcibiades, in honor of the eloquent Athenian. The luxury and ease with which the Persians were surrounded pleased Alcibiades after his course of Spartan fare and discipline, and he indulged for a time in even greater magnificence than did Tissaphernes. His anger against the Athenians had gradually grown less vehement, and he now began to wish that they would forget their hatred of him and recall him from exile. But they had little thought to spare for the traitor, for troubles were pouring in upon them on every side. They had but lately heard of the complete overthrow of their fleet and army in Sicily, and they were now building a new fleet, with money which Pericles had put aside long before, lest at any time Attica should be invaded by sea. The Spartans, too, were still at Decelia, where they had built a fort, not fourteen miles from the city. Town after town that had been allied with Athens in the time of her prosperity, now became her enemy. In their despair, the Athenians had taken a desperate step. They had asked their old enemies, the Persians, to come to their aid. It was then that Alcibiades saw an opportunity, as he thought, to help the people whom he had so cruelly betrayed, and at the same time to please the Persians. So he sent a message to the Athenians to say that if they would place the government of Athens in the hands of a party named the Four Hundred, he would be able to persuade Tissaphernes to make an alliance with them. For his master, the great king, would make no terms with Athens as long as she was a democracy. The Athenians followed Alcibiades's advice, and the government of the city was entrusted to the four hundred for a short time. But Alcibiades had not so much influenced as he had believed, and the Persian government still refused to help the Athenians, partially perhaps in anger with Tissaphernes, partially because the Athenians were not satisfied with the rule of the four hundred. Alcibiades helped to overthrow them and to make Athens once again a democracy. So grateful were the people for his help, that they declared his exile was at an end, and bade him return to Athens. But although Alcibiades longed to go back to Athens, he was content to wait until he could return covered with glory. 
By his own request he was given the command of a few ships, and with these he set sail for the Hellespont. Mindarus, the Spartan admiral, with a large army was there, hoping to stop the corn supply of Athens on its way to the city from the Black Sea. If the corn supply was stopped, Athens would starve, and Mindarus knew that the city would then soon be in the hands of the Spartans. The Athenian fleet was in three divisions, and the one commanded by Alcibiades passed the Hellespont unseen by the enemy and took Mindarus by surprise. By land and sea, desperate battles were fought, and in both, the Athenians were victorious. Mindarus was slain, and the Spartan fleet was destroyed. The Hellespont was not blocked, and Athens was no longer in danger of starving. The Spartans, in their own laconic way, sent a brief message to Sparta to tell of their defeat. The despatch was seized by the Athenians before it reached its destination. This is what the victorious people read. The ships are gone. Mindarus is slain. The men are starving. We know not what to do. For two years, from 409 BC to 407 BC, Alcibiades stayed at the Hellespont, retaking cities which had thrown off their allegiance to Athens and joined Sparta. Then, feeling that now he might return with glory, he set sail for Athens. Plutarch tells us that as Alcibiades drew near to the Piraeus, he was afraid to venture on shore, until he saw friends waiting to welcome him. As soon as he was landed, the multitude who came out to meet him scarcely seemed so much as to see any of the other captains but came in throngs about Alcibiades and saluted him with loud acclamations, and still followed him. Those who could press near him crowned him with garlands, and they who could not come up so close yet stayed to behold him afar off, and the old men pointed him out and showed him to the young ones. In the assembly, crowns of gold were placed on his head, and he was created general, with absolute power, over both the land and the sea forces. His estates were given back to him, and a holy herald was bidden to absolve him from the curses which had been pronounced against him. The high priest alone refused to obey, for he said, if he is innocent, I never cursed him. End of section 76《セクション77of The Story of Greece》told the boys and girls。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jared Shaw. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. Antiochus disobeys Alcibiades. The king of Persia was not pleased with his governor, Tissaphernes, because he had made an alliance with neither the Athenians nor the Spartans. So he now sent his younger son Cyrus to take the place of Tissaphernes, bidding him make terms with the Spartans. Lysander was now in command of the Spartan fleet. He was as brave and as skillful an admiral as Brasidas had been although he could not win the trust of strangers, as his famous countrymen had done. But he gained the affection of his men, and cared for their welfare. Cyrus invited Lysander to a feast, and tried to bribe him to join the Persians, but in vain. The Persian prince then offered to give him whatever he chose to ask. Lysander wished nothing for himself, but, to the surprise of all who were present, he begged that the daily wage of his sailors might be increased. In September 407 BC, the Spartans sailed with his fleet close to the harbor of Ephesus. About the same time, Alcibiades, with the Athenian fleet, arrived at Notium, 
from which port he could watch the movements of the enemy. As he had little money with which to pay his men, he determined to leave the fleet in charge of his pilot, Antiochus, while he, taking with him a few ships, sailed away to plunder a neighboring city. In this way, he hoped to find the money that he needed. Alcibiades strictly forbade Antiochus to risk a battle. No sooner, however, had the admiral gone than the pilot disobeyed his orders, and with a number of ships he sailed past the Spartan fleet, challenging Lysander to fight. The Spartan, in reply, merely sent a few vessels to drive away the reckless pilot, but the ships that had been left at Notium soon noticed that Antiochus was being chased, and they at once hastened to join him. In a short time, the two fleets were engaged in battle. Antiochus was slain, and fifteen of the Athenian ships were taken or sunk. Those that escaped sailed to Samos, where Alcibiades soon joined them. He determined, if it were possible, to avenge the punishment the Spartans had inflicted on the Athenian vessels. So he sailed to Ephesus and offered battle to Lysander. But the Spartan had won a great victory, and he did not mean to risk a defeat. He refused to fight again. Alcibiades still had enemies in Athens, and they were so angry with him for having left the charge of the fleet to Antiochus that they clamored for his command to be taken from him. The assembly was forced to yield to them, and Alcibiades was deposed, while the command was given to an Athenian named Conan. The admiral then fled to a city on the Hellespont, where he had long ago bought a castle, lest any time he should need a place of refuge from his enemies. Conan, the new commander, gained a great victory at the island of Argynice on the coast of Asia. After the victory, a storm arose, and a dozen Athenian vessels, which had been disabled in the battle, went down with all their crews on board. No attempt was made to rescue the unfortunate sailors, and eight Athenian generals were ordered to come home to be tried for neglect of duty. Six only obeyed. The assembly met and condemned the generals, but their sentence was left undetermined. On the day after the trial, a festival was held in the city at which solemn family gatherings took place. When the relations of those who had perished at Argynice appeared, clad in black, their number roused the people to fresh fury against the condemned generals. The assembly met shortly afterwards, and one of the members demanded that the people should vote without delay, and if the generals were found guilty, that they should be put to death. Now the generals had not yet finished their defense. Moreover, there was a law in Athens that prisoners should be judged and sentenced one at a time. At first the assembly wished to obey this law, but the mob was so fierce that it yielded and pronounced sentence of death on all the generals at once. To each was brought a cup of hemlock. Socrates was present in the assembly, and he was not afraid to denounce the sentence as unlawful, nor would he withdraw his protest in the face of the angry crowd. This was a brave deed, such as you would expect from the great philosopher. End of section 77「Section 78 of The Story of Greece told the boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jared Shaw. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. The walls of Athens are destroyed. The last battle of the Peloponnesian War was fought in the Hellespont, in 405 BC, the Athenians had drawn up their ships near a desolate spot named Agospotami, and they soon found 
that it was an awkward place from which to get provisions for their army. There were no houses near from which they could demand help, so the sailors were forced to leave their ships and scour the country round about for food. So dreary was the spot that the Athenians longed to fight at once. But Lysander was in a strong position on the other side of the strait. He had, too, a plentiful supply of food, so that he did not mean to let himself be forced into a battle. Again and again the Athenians sailed across the strait, hoping to tempt the Spartans to fight, but Lysander refused to move. As the weeks passed, the Athenians grew careless of an enemy that seemed too lazy or too cowardly to fight. They left their ships well nigh unguarded and wandered over the country in large numbers in search of food. Alcibiades, from his castle not far off, saw that the Athenians were in a dangerous position and that they were leaving their ships unprotected. He rode over to Agos Potami to warn the generals to seek a safer position. At Sestos, a town but two miles off, they would be better able to defend themselves from the Spartans should they be attacked. They would also be able to command provisions. But the generals did not wish to listen to Alcibiades, and their pride forbade them to follow his advice. They spoke rudely to him, telling him to be gone, that now not he but others had command of the forces. The very day after Alcibiades had warned them, the Athenians, leaving their ships for the most part unmanned, set out to search the countryside for food. Lysander knew how the enemy usually spent the afternoons. Now that they had grown heedless of danger, he determined to attack the forsaken ships without further delay. So he ordered his vessels to row quickly across the strait, and he found, as he expected, the Athenian fleet utterly unprepared for battle. There was indeed no battle fought, for the Spartans easily captured 170 ships and took more than 4,000 prisoners, among whom were three or four admirals. Conan alone, with eight ships, succeeded in escaping, but he dared not return to Athens with tidings of the disaster, for he knew that if he did so, he would be condemned to death. So he sent a ship to carry the terrible news to the city. It was evening when the vessel reached Piraeus. The noise of the wailing spread all up the long walls into the city, as one passed the tidings on to another. That night no one slept. For now there was no fleet to hinder the Spartans from stopping the supply of corn, and the Athenians knew that they must starve or surrender. For a little while, the city refused to yield, but she had no allies, no ships, no money, and no corn could enter the town. The wretched people were dying of hunger before Athens surrendered to the Spartans in March 404 BC. She expected no mercy from her conqueror. Even as she had destroyed many a Spartan town, so she thought that now she herself would be utterly ruined. But Sparta proved less harsh than Athens had deemed was possible. The city was indeed to be rendered harmless forever, but not destroyed. All that was left of her fleet was taken away, and the walls of Piraeus and the walls leading to Athens were pulled down. Lysander stood near, looking on, as the Athenians and the Spartans together began to break down the walls. It was not so gloomy a scene as you might have expected. Perhaps the Athenians were glad that at length the long and desperate struggle had come to an end. Flute players and dancers were present and added a strange touch of gaiety to the crowd. Soon after the surrender of Athens, Lysander was ordered to put Alcibiades to death lest he should encourage the Athenians at any time to throw off their allegiance to Sparta. Plutarch tells us that those who were sent to assassinate him had not courage enough to enter the house, but surrounded it first and set it on fire. Alcibiades 
as soon as he perceived it, getting together great quantities of clothes and furniture, threw them upon the fire to choke it. And having wrapped his cloak about his left arm, and holding his naked sword in his right, he cast himself into the middle of the fire, and escaped securely through it, before his clothes were burnt. The barbarians, as soon as they saw him, retreated, and none of them durst stay to wait for him, or to engage with him, but, standing at a distance, they slew him with darts and arrows. End of section 78「Section 79 of The Story of Greece told the boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jared Shaw. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. The March of the Ten Thousand. In 404 BC, Soon after the disaster of Agospotami, Darius, king of Persia, died. His eldest son, Artaxerxes, succeeded to his father's throne. Cyrus, the younger son, who was present at his father's death, was accused by Tissaphernes of trying to secure the throne for himself. Artaxerxes believed Tissaphernes, and Cyrus was arrested and would have been put to death had not his mother pleaded that his life might be spared. The king listened to his mother's request and set his brother free. He even allowed him to govern the provinces that had been his in his father's lifetime. But Cyrus felt no gratitude to his brother. He hated him and was determined, if it were possible, to seize his throne. So he hired a large number of Greek soldiers for now that there was peace between Athens and Sparta, many of them were idle and glad to take service under Cyrus. The prince pretended that he was going to fight against Tissaphernes, and no one save himself and the Spartan, Clearchus, who was the leader of the Greeks, knew that the army was going to Babylon to fight against Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Among the Greek soldiers was Xenophon, a scholar and a pupil of Socrates, who wrote the story of this expedition. Early in 401 BC, Cyrus assembled his troops at Sardis. When they arrived at Tarsus, a city on the coast of Cilicia, the soldiers began to suspect that Cyrus was going to lead them against Artaxerxes. They were not afraid of the great king, but they were afraid to leave the sea behind them for that was ever a terrible thing to the Greeks, so they refused to march farther. Clearchus, who was a stern commander and no favorite with his men, tried in vain to quell their rebellion, but all his efforts were vain. Not a step forward would they march. He had used his authority and failed. Now he resolved not to command, but to persuade. So he called his men together again, and as he looked at them, he wept. Their grim, stern commander shedding tears, the soldiers stared at him in open-eyed wonder. Then Clearchus bade them see in how difficult a position they had placed him, for he must either fail Cyrus or forsake them. Forsake them he could not, so he declared, for were they not his country, his friends, and his allies? These words pleased the soldiers well, but what pleased them even more was that when Cyrus sent to ask their commander to go to his tent, he refused to go. But they were less content when Clearchus reminded them that as they refused to follow Cyrus, they could no longer expect him to give them food or wages. What, he asked them, did they mean to do? All that they could do was to send a few of their number to the prince to ask him where he intended to lead them. Cyrus answered that he was taking them to the river Euphrates to fight against a Persian rebel, and at the same time he offered to increase their wages if they would obey Clearchus. The Greeks were not far from home, and not knowing what else to do, 
they agreed to follow their commander. But they did not trust Cyrus, and they still suspected that he wished to march beyond the river Euphrates. And when they reached the river, their suspicions proved true, for Cyrus told them plainly that he was going to Babylon to dethrone his brother, Artaxerxes. As the Euphrates was unusually shallow, the army was able to cross it over on foot, and soon afterwards it was in the desert of Arabia. Xenophon tells us that the desert was smooth as a sea. There were no large trees in all the great expanse, but there were many shrubs that had a pleasant scent. The soldiers did not find the march across the desert dull, for they saw many strange beasts, unlike any they had ever seen. Wild asses, ostriches, antelopes, and these they hunted with zest. When the desert lay behind them, they found themselves in a land where fields had been dug and gardens tended. Here, too, a little before them, was Artaxerxes, with a great army, ready to fight to the death for his crown. The king was encamped at a place called Cunasi, where in the summer of 401 BC a battle was fought. Strange as it may seem, before a blow was struck, the Persians were seized with panic and turned to flee. Only Tissaphernes at the head of the cavalry stood firm. Cyrus, with a small body of men, about six hundred in number, dashed upon the center of the army, for there, surrounded by six thousand horsemen, was Artaxerxes. The guards scattered before his fierce attack, and the king turned to fly with them. Then Cyrus, careless of aught, save his desire to slay his brother and gain his crown, galloped after him, attended by only a few of his own bodyguard. As he drew near to the king, he hurled a javelin at him and wounded him slightly. Almost at the same moment, Cyrus himself was wounded in the eye, and shortly after he fell from his horse and was slain. Cyrus was dead, and ten thousand Greek soldiers were left alone with their generals in a strange land, surrounded by enemies. Tissaphernes pretended to be a friend to the Greeks, and offered to guide them safely home. So the two armies set out together, but before long the Greek soldiers grew suspicious of the Persians. To reassure the men, Tissaphernes invited Clearchus and his captains to his tent. The Greek general accepted the invitation, and, never dreaming of treachery, he went to the Persians' tent with four other generals, twenty captains, and a few soldiers. No sooner had they entered than the captains and soldiers were seized and put to death by the order of Tissaphernes. Clearchus and the other generals were loaded with chains and sent to the king. Artaxerxes commanded that they too should be put to death. The Persians believed that the Greek army would now be forced to surrender. For, alone in an unknown land, without a leader, how could they hope to reach their own country? But the greatness of their danger roused the courage of the Greeks. Xenophon, who was at the time only a young man, made an eloquent speech to the army, bidding them choose new generals and obey them, for in this way only could they hope to escape from their enemies. The men did as he advised, choosing Xenophon himself as one of the new generals. And now began the retreat of the ten thousand through untold difficulties. To go back the same way as they had come was impossible, for the roads would be guarded by the Persians. So they turned to the north and marched through a wild and barren country, where fierce hillmen held the narrow passes through which they must pass. Sometimes the savage tribes hurled down upon them from the heights great pieces of rock, and the soldiers lived in dread of being crushed to death by their unseen foes. When they reached Armenia, it was December and bitterly cold. They were overtaken by a snowstorm so severe that many of the men lost their way. In vain they tried to rejoin their comrades, and at length, utterly worn out, they stumbled into the great snowdrifts, or lay down on the road to die. Still the army struggled bravely on, 
in the face of the biting north wind, until at length it reached a tributary of the river Euphrates. This they crossed in safety, to find that most of their difficulties were over, for soon after they reached a city called Gymnius. Gymnius was a prosperous mining town, and the inhabitants welcomed the ten thousand gladly and gave them food and shelter after they had heard of the terrible difficulties through which the men had come. But the soldiers did not linger long at Gymnius. They were eager to set out again, for a guide promised that in five days he would bring them to the sea. On the fifth day, the Greeks came to a hill, and when the van reached the summit, a great cry arose. When Xenophon and those at the rear heard it, they thought that an enemy was attacking in front. But when the cry increased as fresh men continually came up to the summit, Xenophon thought it must be something more serious, and galloped forward to the front with his cavalry. As he drew near, he heard what the cry was. The sea! The sea! A few days more, and the ten thousand were on Greek soil. Here they rested for a month, offering glad sacrifices of thanksgiving to Zeus, who had brought them back in safety to their own land. End of section 79「Section 80 of the Story of Greece, told to boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jared Shaw. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. Pelopidas and Epaminondas. When Sparta heard that Artaxerxes had been able neither to force the ten thousand to surrender nor to slay them, she thought that his army could not be very powerful. So, confident in her own strength, she went to war against the great king, dreaming that she would conquer Persia and add it to her dominions. But instead of conquering the country, the Spartans were so often defeated that in 387 BC, they were willing to make peace on any terms which Artaxerxes chose to make. And the king saw to it that the terms were severe, for he demanded that the Greek cities in Asia, which had now been free for ninety years, should once again acknowledge him as their lord. To those Greeks who loved their country truly, it seemed better to fight to death than to accept such terms. Nor will you wonder at this as you read the proud words in which the king couched his demands. King Artaxerxes thinks it just, he wrote, that the Greek cities in Asia should belong to him. He also thinks it just to leave all the other Grecian cities, both small and great, independent, except three cities which are to belong to Athens as of old. Should any parties refuse to accept this peace, I will make war upon them, along with those who are of the same mind, both by land and sea, with ships and with money. The states of Greece accepted these terms, which were carved on stones and placed in their temples, so it could be seen by all that Greece was no longer free. Although Sparta had been defeated by the Persians, she was the most powerful state in Greece. Wishing to add to her possessions, she determined to seize the little town of Thebes, which at this time was friendly with Athens. The two governors of Thebes, Leontiades and Ismenias, did not get on well together. Leontiades disliked his colleague so bitterly that he was ready even to betray his city, if by doing so he could injure Ismenias. In September 382 BC, a Spartan army, led by a general named Phoebidas, chanced to be marching through Boeotia. Not far from the walls of Thebes, the soldiers halted to rest. Leontiades thought this was the opportunity for which he had been waiting. He would be able to get rid of Ismenias with the help of the Spartans. They had already determined to seize the town, but this the traitor did not know. 
he went secretly to the camp, asked for Phoebidas, and was admitted to the general's tent. He at once offered to open the gates of Thebes to the Spartans on the following day. It would be an easy matter to seize the citadel if the gates were opened, for on the morrow a festival kept by women alone was to be held there, while at noon the men would be in their houses, dozing during the hottest part of the day. The Spartan general was as eager to take the city as Leontiades could desire, and the traitor slipped back to the city, thinking of nothing save that Ismenius would soon be out of his way. At noon on the following day, the Spartans marched to the gates of Thebes, and there, according to his compact, was Leontiades waiting to admit them. Silently he drew the keys from under his cloak, unlocked the gates, and Phoebidas, at the head of two thousand men, entered the city. They made their way at once to the citadel, took possession of it, and made the women, who were keeping the festival, prisoners. Before long, the men of Thebes roused themselves from their noontide nap to find, to their dismay, that their wives and daughters were in the hands of the Spartans. Leontiades ordered his rival Ismenias to be arrested, and soon after the miserable governor was sent to Sparta and cruelly put to death. Three hundred Thebans, who were determined not to submit to Sparta, succeeded in escaping from the city and reaching Athens. Many who wished to flee did not dare to do so, lest in their absence harm should befall their wives and daughters. Leontiades was rewarded for his treachery by being still allowed to rule in Thebes, along with a Spartan general. So harshly did Leontiades use his power that the people hated him, but the years passed before the tyrant's power was wrested from him. During these years, those who had fled to Athens often heard from the miserable Thebans of the hardships they suffered under the stern rule of Leontiades. Among the exiles was a young nobleman named Pelopidas. Often he would tell his fellow exiles that it was dishonorable to dwell in comfort in Athens while their city was not free, and he would urge them to march against the Spartans and banish them from Thebes. Pelopidas had a great friend in Thebes named Epaminondas, and although the two friends did brave deeds not only for their city, but for Greece, they are remembered most of all for the great love they bore each to the other. Both were of noble birth, but Pelopidas was rich, while Epaminondas was poor. Pelopidas had a generous nature and used his money to help those who were not so well off as he was. Even among his friends, many were quick to accept his kindness, but Epaminondas would never take from him either gold or gifts. Pelopidas resolved that if Epaminondas would not share his wealth, he would share his friend's poverty. So he bade his slaves lay aside his soft, silk robes, that he might clad himself in garments as simple as those of Epaminondas. He would allow no rich dishes to be set before him at table, but he ordered that his food should be both plain and scanty. In the camp, he endured hardships as a common soldier. In war, he showed himself bold as a lion. The friends were clever and well-trained, both in mind and body, but Pelopidas was often to be found in the fields, while Epaminondas was listening to lectures. Each longed to serve his country well, but no touch of jealousy disturbed the beauty of their friendship. It was founded deep on reverence and love. Some years before the treachery of Leontiades, when the Spartans were at war with Athens, the Thebans had sent a troop of soldiers to the aid of Sparta. Among the soldiers were the two friends Pelopidas and Epaminondas. The company with which the Theban soldiers fought was beaten, and many fled from the field. But Pelopidas and Epaminondas joined their shields together and fought on bravely. Pelopidas was wounded seven times, and at length, faint with the loss of blood, he fell to the ground. 
Epaminondas thought that his comrade was dead, but he resolved that the enemy should have neither the arms nor the body of his friend. So he stood over him with his shield, willing rather to die and forsake his helpless Pelopidas. Soon, Epaminondas himself was so severely wounded that he was no longer able to defend the body of his friend. Had not the king of Sparta chanced to see his danger, and with a few followers dashed to his rescue, he would have been slain by the foe. But the king carried off both Epaminondas and Pelopidas, who was then found to be still alive. Pelopidas recovered, although his wounds had been severe, and never did he forget that it was his friend who had saved his life. End of section 80、section、81 Section of The Story of Greece, told to boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jared Shaw. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. The Seven Conspirators. Three years passed before the Theban exiles, encouraged by Pelopidas, formed a plot to deliver their city from the Spartans. They were helped in their plans by Philidas, a Theban who had stayed in the city and become secretary to the Spartan governors Archias and Philippus. He had taken this position under the enemy that he might be the better to help his own countrymen. He agreed with Pelopidas that the time to act had now come. Epaminondas was also in Thebes, but he would have nothing to do with the plot. He would fight when the time for fighting came, but to slay even tyrants unawares was not to his liking. Pelopidas and six other exiles. Did not share the scruples of Epaminondas. They disguised themselves as farmers or country folk, and one evening, reaching Thebes as it began to grow dark, they slipped one by one at different times into the city. They then found their way to the house of a citizen named Charon, who had promised to shelter them. Snow was falling, and the streets were nearly deserted, so that the return of the exiles. Was unnoticed. On the following day, Archaeus and Philippus were to be present at a great banquet. Philidas, the secretary, had promised to bring to the feast seven beautiful Theban women. He told no one that the promised guests were the seven exiles, who had resolved to don a second disguise to enable them to be present at the banquet. The day of the feast passed slowly for the conspirators. But at length evening came, and the exiles were putting on the garments that were to make them appear like beautiful women. When a loud knock came to the door, already the long day had tried them sorely, and the knock filled them with foreboding. When the door was opened, their hearts beat quicker, for there stood a soldier who bade Charon come to the banqueting hall without delay. Had Charon betrayed them? The exiles looked uncertainly. One at the other. Then they grew ashamed of their distrust and bade their host hasten to Archaeus to allay his suspicions, if indeed they had been aroused. Charon was brave and true, and he knew that the lives of the seven men were in his hand. He hoped that they trusted him, yet he wished to dispel any doubt that they might have. So he hastened to the nursery of his little son. And carrying the child to Pelopidas, he placed him in his arms, saying, "If you find me a traitor, treat the boy as an enemy without any mercy." But the exiles protested, and truly, that they trusted him well and needed no such hostage. While Pelopidas bade him take the child back to his nurse. Then Charon, staying only to ask the help of the gods, hastened to the banqueting hall. Archaeus and his secretary were awaiting him, and Archaeus said, "I have heard, Charon, that there are some men just come lurking into the town. 
We fear lest they have come to stir up the citizens. Who are they? Where are they hidden? asked Charon, for he wished to find out how much Archaeus knew. But Archaeus knew nothing. It was but a rumor that had reached him. Do not disturb yourself because of a rumor, said Charon, who had now no fear of discovery. There are many tales told in the marketplace, but I will find out if there is truth in what you have heard. Archaeus was glad to leave the matter to Charon, for he was impatient to go back to the feast. So Charon hasted back to his house to tell Pelopidas and his comrades that their fears were needless, for Archaeus suspected nothing. But although Charon did not know it, a letter was at that moment being placed in the hands of Archaeus that might easily have ruined both him and the conspirators. For it told Archaeus the whole plot, as well as the names of those who were to take part in it. The letter had been sent from Athens, and as the messenger handed it to the Spartan governor, he said, The writer of this desired that it might be read at once. It is on urgent business. But Archaeus could think of nothing that night, save the banquet and the beautiful Theban women, who should now soon arrive. Thrusting the letter unopened under the cushion on which his head rested, Archaeus cried, a smile upon his face, Urgent business tomorrow! And these words were ever after used as a proverb by the Greeks. The conspirators had now reached the hall. Their beautiful dresses were wide and loose, for beneath their splendor they wore armor. On their heads were garlands of pine and fir, so that their faces might not be seen. Archaeus and his guests clapped their hands gleefully. Here at last were the beautiful Theban women, whose presence Philidas had promised should grace the banquet. But in a moment the conspirators had torn off their disguise. Archaeus and Philippus were slain almost before they had time to realize their danger, while the guests, who had rushed to their aid, were also put to death. Pelopidas and his comrades then hastened to the house of Leontiades. But he heard them knocking at the door, and when they rushed into his room a few seconds later, he met them with his sword drawn, and slew the first man who entered. A terrible struggle then took place between Leontiades and Pelopidas, but at length the traitor was wounded to death. The conspirators then ran to the prison, ordered the gates to be opened, and the prisoners to be set free and armed, for their only crime had been loyalty to their city. As the day began to dawn, troops from Athens poured into the city to help the Thebans. The Spartans fought fiercely, but after a few days the garrison was forced to surrender, and once again Thebes was free. The grateful citizens then assembled in the marketplace, where the priests crowned Pelopidas and Charon, while the people appointed them governors of the city. End of section 81section 82 of the story of greece told to boys and girls this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by jared shaw the story of greece by mary mcgregor the battle of lake tra Thebes had always been a dull, unambitious, little town, but now her ambition awoke. She was not content only to be free. She wished to become the most important town in Boeotia, and there was one of her citizens who was so great a soldier and so wise a statesman that he was able to do for Thebes more than she dreamed. Epaminondas not only made Thebes the chief city in Boeotia, but several years later, he conquered the Spartans, and so made her the most important town in Greece. Pelopidas, too, fought for the glory of his country. He became captain of a band of 300 young Thebans, who had sworn to defend their city with their lives. 
These 300 soldiers, more strictly trained than other youths, were named the Sacred Band because each member was a friend to the other. As they had sworn to defend their city, so they had promised to stand by one another unto death. After many victories, of which you will read, the Sacred Band fell on the battlefield. Even their conqueror, as he looked upon them, shed tears, saying, Perish any man who suspects that these men either did or suffered anything that was base. For two years after Thebes won back her freedom, Sparta never ceased to try to wrench it from her. But at the end of two years, she was forced to leave the Thebans alone, for all her soldiers were needed to fight against the Athenians, who had once more declared war against their ancient foe. While the Spartans and Athenians waged war, one against the other, Epaminondas was not idle, for he subdued the Boeotian cities, which had dared to help Sparta while Thebes was in her power. Pelopidas, too, won a great victory in 375 BC against the Spartans at Orchomenus. He had with him only the sacred band and a small company of cavalry when he found himself unawares facing a large Spartan army. We are fallen into the midst of the enemy, cried one of the band. Why so, more than they into the midst of us, said Pelopidas. The rare confidence of their captain inspired the band to fight even more valiantly than usual, and to win a great victory over the large army of the Spartans. This victory encouraged the Thebans so much that in the following year they succeeded in banishing the Spartans from Boeotia. Thebes was now at the head of the Boeotian Confederacy, just as Sparta was ruler of the Laconian Confederacy. Four years later, in 371 BC, the Greek states met to arrange terms of peace among themselves. It was agreed that each city should be treated as independent, but when Agesilaus, king of Sparta, rose to take the oath, he took it not alone for his own city, but for the cities that belonged to her allies as well. Epaminondas sprang to his feet to remonstrate, saying that if Agesilaus was allowed to take the oath for the allied cities, he too must be permitted to take it for all the cities of Boeotia. The Spartan king, angry with the bold demand of the Theban, taunted him with taking away the liberty of the Boeotian cities. And what do you do with the liberty of the cities of Laconia? retorted Epaminondas. Agesilaus was astonished at what he considered the insolence of the Theban. In a rage, he snatched up the treaty of peace, struck out the name of Thebes, crying that if the Thebans wished war, they should have it. The other cities signed the treaty, so Sparta and Thebes were left to settle their quarrel alone. Epaminondas hastened back to Thebes, where he was at once chosen general of the Theban army. Without delay, he set out to secure a pass by which he thought the Spartans would attempt to enter Boeotia. But the Spartans, led by Cleombrotus, one of their kings, did not try to enter by the pass. Finding a narrow mountain track, they succeeded in eluding Epaminondas and reaching within eight miles of Thebes. Here, on the plain of Lake Tra, the Spartans encamped in 371 BC. Near to Lake Tra were the tombs of two Boeotian maidens. Many years ago, they had slain themselves because of the cruelty with which the Spartans had treated them. An old prophecy said that some day the Spartans would be defeated at the tombs of the maidens. Epaminondas, although he did not greatly believe in soothsayers, encouraged his captains to fight by reminding them of this old saying. Before the battle, Pelopidas had a strange dream. In his dream, he saw the two maidens of Lake Tra alive and wandering about the plain. Their father, too, was there, 
and Pelopidas heard him say that if the Thebans wished for victory, they must sacrifice to the gods a maiden with chestnut hair. When he awoke, Pelopidas told his dream to the other captains, and as they were wondering what to do, a colt of bright chestnut color ran through the camp. So, cried a soothsayer, the sacrifice is come. Expect no other, but use that which the gods have sent. Then the colt was solemnly offered in sacrifice at the tombs of the maidens, and the army was content, for the gods, they were sure, would give them the victory. Until now, the Greek army had always been drawn out in a long, narrow line. But Epaminondas arranged his men in a new way. His left wing was only a few men wide, but it was fifty men deep, which made it unusually strong. Pelopidas, with his sacred band, was placed in front of the heavy left wing, while the rest of the army was arranged as usual. The Spartan cavalry attacked the Theban horse, but it was soon driven from the field. Cleombrotus was with his right wing, and he now led it against the strong left wing of the enemy. Bravely as the Spartans fought, they could not withstand the onslaught of the left wing, led by the sacred band. Cleombrotus fell and was carried from the field, wounded to death. The Spartans still struggled bravely, although their king was slain. But when Epaminondas called to his men, Give me a step more and the day is ours, the Thebans spurred on to one more effort, broke the Spartan line, and put it to flight. The Thebans had won the day, but with little loss of life, while four hundred Spartans had been slain. Cleombrotus was the first Spartan king who had fallen on a battlefield since the fatal day of Thermopylae. The terrible news of the defeat of Lectra was sent to Sparta, but the citizens were too well disciplined to show the dismay which they must have felt. They had been beaten by the inhabitants of the dull little town of Thebes, yet no sound of grief was heard in their streets, nor was any sign of mourning to be seen. It was on a festive day that the fateful tidings reached the city, and sacrifices were offered, and games held as though nothing had happened to interrupt the usual rites. Those whose friends had fled looked sullen and ashamed, for it was counted a disgrace to leave a lost battlefield alive. Those whose friends had fought to the death were to be seen in the streets the following day, with faces that were calm and content. Of such stern stuff were the Spartans made. End of section 82《Section 83 of the Story of Greece, told to boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jared Shaw. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. The Death of Epaminondas. Thebes was now the most powerful city in Greece, but Epaminondas was not yet content. He wished to invade Sparta. In November 370 BC, he marched with his army into Arcadia, which lay to the north of Laconia. Here he was joined by all those who wished to throw off the Spartan yoke. His army soon numbered 40,000, some even say it was 70,000 strong. Sparta could hardly believe that anyone had dared to invade her territory. She was used to fighting in other states of Greece or in other countries, but it would be a new experience if she was forced to fight for her own homes. Yet there was Epaminondas and his army encamped within sight of the city. The Spartan women had never before seen the smoke of an enemy's fire camp, and they gave way to despair in spite of their stern training in self-control. But the Theban general, 
was too wise to attack the city. He knew that the Spartans had gathered together a large army, and that they would fight to the death for their homes. So, satisfied that he had encamped in sight of Sparta, he turned away, destroying the land through which he passed. The Spartans were eager to follow and fight with the enemy who had defied them, but their king refused to lead them to battle. Epaminondas was not yet ready to leave Spartan territory. He led his army to the country of Messenia, which the Spartans had conquered many centuries before, banishing or making slaves of the people. The Theban general roused the descendants of these slaves and encouraged them to build a new city on Mount Ithome, where Aristomenes had made his gallant stand against the Spartans. While the first stones of the new city were being laid, the sound of flutes was heard. When it was finished, it was named Messenia. A large piece of ground, which belonged to Sparta, was given by Epaminondas to the citizens of the new town. Those who had been slaves, or helots, were now free men. The army then marched back to Thebes, which it reached four months after the time for which Epaminondas had been appointed commander. In spite of all he had done for his country, his enemies wished him to be punished, because he had not laid down his command on the proper day. But he appealed to the people, and they gladly made him, along with Pelopidas, general for another year. When the year had passed, Epaminondas was treated coldly, not only by his enemies, but by the people also, because he had failed to surprise and take the city of Corinth. In Thessaly at this time, there was a cruel king named Alexander. So badly did he treat his subjects that they begged the Thebans to come to their help. Pelopidas was sent to Thessaly to punish Alexander, unless he promised to treat his people less harshly. The king was forced to listen to the Theban general, but he was angry because Pelopidas had dared to interfere with him, and he resolved to punish him. For some time the king found no opportunity to reach his enemy, but at length Pelopidas was foolish enough to go through Thessaly with only a few followers. Alexander was overjoyed to have the general in his power, and he at once sent a band of men to capture him and throw him into prison. But the Thebans were very angry when they heard that their favorite general was a prisoner, and they determined to set him free. So they sent a large army into Thessaly to rescue Pelopidas. Epaminondas went with the army as an ordinary soldier, and you can imagine how he must have longed to be at its head, so that he might himself deliver his friend. The Theban generals were not clever, and though they did all they could to conquer the army that Alexander sent against them, they soon saw that the battle was going against them. Then they showed that if they were not clever, they were wise, for they went to Epaminondas and begged him to take command of the army. But it was too late for even a clever general to reach Pelopidas, and all Epaminondas could do was to save the Theban army from being destroyed. The Thebans were so grateful to Epaminondas for his help that they made him general once more and sent him back to Thessaly with a larger army that he might save his friend. Alexander knew that he need not hope to conquer the great Theban general, and a few days after Epaminondas entered Thessaly, the king set Pelopidas free. He then asked the Thebans to make peace with him. Three years later, in 364 BC, Pelopidas was ordered to go at the head of an army against his old enemy. As he was ready to leave Thebes, the sun was eclipsed, and the soothsayers did not hesitate to say that this was a bad omen. Many of the soldiers were afraid to march, and Pelopidas was too angry to wait to force them to go with him. So he set out with only a few men. When he reached Thessaly, he bade all those who hated the tyrant to join him. Thousands who had groaned under the cruelty of the king flocked to his side, but even then the army of Alexander was twice as large as his. 
the two forces met at a place called Sinoscephala, where a great battle was fought. Pelopidas led his men well, and himself fought so bravely that the battle was all but won in spite of the greater strength of the enemy. Suddenly Pelopidas caught sight of Alexander, and forgetting everything save his desire to avenge his imprisonment, he sprang forward to slay the tyrant. Ere his followers could reach him, he himself was struck down and killed. Alexander was defeated and his kingdom was taken from him. But the Thessalians could not rejoice, because Pelopidas, to whom they owed their deliverance, had been slain. They buried him with great pomp on the field where he had fallen. Epaminondas was filled with grief at the loss of his dear friend. He tried to forget his sorrow in serving his country. In 362 BC, he fought at Mantinea against the Spartans, on the field where long before he had saved the life of Pelopidas. Never had Epaminondas fought more bravely than on this day, leading the Boeotians against the foe as a war galley plows through the waves with its beak. The victory was well nigh gained when a Spartan thrust his pike through the breast of Epaminondas. He fell, and his men carried him off the field to a little hill, from which the battle could be seen. For a short time the great general lay unconscious, but at length he opened his eyes and asked if his shield was safe. He was told that it was safe and that the battle was won. Then he begged to see his two chief officers. They had fallen on the field, and when the news was broken to him, the dying man said, Then you had better make peace. The head of the spear that had struck the general was still in the wound. As it was withdrawn, he breathed his last. It was Epaminondas who had made Thebes great. After his death, she slowly slipped back into her old, insignificant position. End of section 83「Chapter 84 of the Story of Greece, told to boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mary Balmer. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. The Two Brothers. The city of Corinth stood upon the narrow isthmus that joined the mainland of Greece to the Peloponnesian Peninsula. She had two harbors, a large fleet, and she carried on a prosperous trade with other countries. As the city grew strong and populous, she began to plant colonies in other lands. One of the wealthiest of these colonies was the town of Syracuse in Sicily. In 346 B.C., Syracuse was in the power of a tyrant named Dionysius. The other cities in Sicily would have been in the same plight had their inhabitants not fled to a neighboring town and sought the aid of a powerful prince named Acetus. Acetus had a large army, and with its help, they hoped to be able to overthrow Dionysius. But trouble after trouble overtook the people, for the Carthaginians had sailed from Africa and had reached their shores. Sicily was in despair, lest they should conquer the island and make it their own. In their distress, the Sicilians sent messengers to Corinth, their mother city, to beg her to help them to get rid of both the Carthaginians and Dionysius. Acetus pretended to approve of this, but no sooner had the ambassadors set out for Corinth than he made friends with the Carthaginians. He hoped that if they drove Dionysius away, he himself would become tyrant of Sicily. In Corinth, about twenty years earlier, there dwelt two brothers of noble birth. 
One was named Timophanes, the other Timoleon. Never were two brothers more unlike, save that both were brave. Timophanes was cruel and ambitious, while Timoleon was gentle and content. Yet under his quiet ways, Timoleon had one strong passion, and that was the love he bore his country. Timovanes was a captain in the Corinthian army. His brother served in the ranks. Once, when the captain was sent against a neighboring state, he was thrown from his horse, which had been wounded. He fell close to the enemy, and his men fled, leaving him in danger of being taken prisoner. Timoleon saw what had happened, and, rushing from the ranks, he stood over Timophanes with his shield and defended him from the spears which were being hurled at him by the enemy. Although he himself was sorely wounded, he never flinched. But at length his comrades rushed to his aid and drove off the foe. Timoleon had saved his brother's life. Not long after this, Timophanes was given the command of 400 foreign soldiers. This pleased the captain, but to the dismay of the citizens, he used the troops to make himself tyrant of the city. All who dared to oppose him, he put to death, while he ruled so harshly that he was hated and feared by everyone. Timoleon was ashamed of his brother's behavior. He begged him to treat the people more kindly, and if he must rule, at least to rule with justice. But Timophan first mocked at his brother's words, and then he grew angry and refused to listen to them. Gentle as Timoleon was, he could be strong when there was need to be so. In a short time, he went again to his brother, taking with him two friends who used to admire Timophanes. Together, the three men besought the tyrant to give up the power he had so wrongfully seized and to serve his country in an upright way. Again, Timophanes laughed at his friends, but when they persisted in their entreaties, he grew angry and rudely bade them be gone. Then Timoleon hid his face in his cloak and wept while the others put his brother to death. The Corinthians, for the most part, praised Timoleon because he loved his country so well that he sacrificed his brother for her sake. But there were some citizens who blamed Timoleon for allowing his brother to be put to death before his eyes. His mother refused to see him and called down upon him the curses of the gods. This pained Timoleon more than anything else, and he begged her to see him, if it were but once, but she would not allow him to enter her house. Timoleon loved his mother, and her treatment made him so sad that he refused either to eat or to drink. He resolved to starve himself to death rather than endure his mother's reproaches. His friends did all they could to comfort him, and at length they succeeded in persuading him to eat. But his sorrow was too great to let him stay in Corinth. So he left the city, and for several years he lived by himself. Even when he returned to Corinth, he still refused to take part in any public business. Timoleon was fifty years old when in 346 B.C., the Syracusans sent him to the Corinthians to beg for help against the Carthaginians. The Corinthians determined to send an army to Sicily to help their fellow countrymen, but they could find no one willing to go at its head. Someone proposed that Timoleon should be made commander of the force that had been raised, and he was at once appointed. Perhaps Timoleon thought that it was now time that he should do something for his country. In any case, he undertook the task that was given him with goodwill. 
one worthy citizen bade Timoleon act like a man of worth and gallantry, for, he said, if you do bravely in this service, we shall believe that you delivered us from a tyrant, but if otherwise, that you killed your brother. End of chapter 84「Section 85 of The Story of Greece, Told to Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Giordano. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. Timoleon Sends Dionysius to Corinth. Timoleon was ready to sail to Sicily with a fleet of seven vessels and a force of about one thousand men when a message from isetus reached the corinthians the trader told them it was useless to try to help the people of sicily for he had joined the carthaginians and their combined army would easily crush any force that was sent against them this made the corinthians so angry that they at once added two hundred soldiers to timoleon's small army as well as three vessels to his fleet. Even so, Timoleon's task seemed hopeless. Athens, with hundreds of ships and with tens of thousands of men, had failed to take Syracuse. How, then, could the Corinthian hope to do so with his handful of men and his small fleet? Before he sailed, Timoleon journeyed to Delphi to offer sacrifices to Apollo. As he prayed in the temple, a wreath slipped from its place and fell upon his head. It seemed to Timoleon that Apollo was already crowning him with victory. At length all was ready, and the army embarked and set sail with a favorable wind. Suddenly a bright flame leaped out from the sky and hovered over the ship in which Timoleon sailed. The flame soon changed into a torch which guided the ships until they reached Regium, a town in Sicily. Here Timoleon learned that Isetus had already defeated Dionysius, who was now shut up in the citadel of Syracuse, and that he had sent the Carthaginians with twenty warships to Regium to keep the Corinthians from reaching Sicily. Timoleon had only ten vessels, and he knew it would be impossible to leave Regium as he could in some way cheat the enemy. So he pretended to agree to Isetus's demands, and then begged the Carthaginian generals to go with him to the assembly to tell the people what they had agreed. Meanwhile, he had given orders to his fleet to be ready to sail the moment he returned. In the assembly, the generals and the people of Regium began to talk, and they grew so interested in what they were saying that they paid very little attention to Timoleon. The generals indeed forgot all about him, which was just what the Corinthians had hoped would happen. By and by, when the conversation seemed most engrossing, Timoleon slipped quietly out of the hall and hastened to the harbor. The moment he was on board his ship, the fleet set sail, and before long reached Sicily in safety. Without their generals, the Carthaginians had not known what to do, and while they hesitated, Timoleon had escaped. But when the Carthaginian generals found out how they had been tricked, their indignation knew no bounds. Not far from the small town at which the Corinthians landed was a city named Adrenum, where there was a temple consecrated to the god Adrenus. This deity was reverenced throughout the whole island. The city was divided into two parties, one of which sent for Isetus, the other for Timoleon, to help them each against the other. Both generals at once set out for Adrenum, Isetus with five thousand, Timoleon with only twelve hundred men. On the second day, the Corinthians found that in spite of all their haste, they had been outstripped by the army of Isetus. It was already encamped close to the city. The Corinthian officers begged Timoleon to order a halt, as there seemed no need for further haste, and their men needed food and rest after their hurried march. But Timoleon wished to take the enemy by surprise. He thought that if they did not delay, they would reach Isetus and his men while they were putting up their tents and preparing supper. So instead of listening to his officers, 
he seized his shield and going to the head of his army he bade them follow him and he would lead them to victory the enemy's camp was still three and a half miles away but the corinthians marched on bravely as timoleon had hoped he reached the camp of the enemy while the men were getting ready a meal and were unprepared to fight before they were aware of his approach timoleon had fallen upon them and put them to flight taking the camp as well as many prisoners the people of adranum at once opened their gates to the victorious general and told him that when the battle began the doors of their temple suddenly opened of their own accord on the threshold stood their god holding his javelin in his hand it was trembling as though the god was weary with its weight other cities when they heard of the victory of the corinthians gladly entered into alliance with them meanwhile dionysius shut up in syracuse by Asetus, was growing tired of his position and food was becoming scarce in the citadel he too thought it would be well to make terms with timoleon so he sent to the corinthian general to offer to surrender the citadel if he would promise to send him in safety to corinth when timoleon heard this he felt more than ever sure that the gods were on his side he gladly accepted the tyrant's offer and at once sent two of his officers and a company of men to receive the keys to the citadel dionysius treated the corinthians well leaving to them a number of horses a store of weapons and two thousand soldiers he himself escaped from the city and fled to the camp of timoleon soon afterwards he set sail for corinth tidings of his arrival was sent before him as the ship drew near to the harbor the people gathered there in excited groups they had often shuddered at the tale of the cruel deeds of the man who was now coming to their city shorn of his power they were eager to see him a few weeks later they wondered if this man had really been as cruel as they had been told they saw him contentedly loitering in the market-place or spending long hours in the shops of the perfumers and it seemed to them as though he must always have been as harmless as he was now in later years the tyrant is said to have taught the boys and girls of corinth to read and he also trained those who wished to sing in public timoleon had not been fifty days in sicily before dionysius was on his way to corinth the corinthians were so pleased with their general that they determined to send him reinforcements both of cavalry and infantry but it was some time before the fresh troops reached timoleon for the carthaginian fleet was waiting near the coast of italy to bar the way End of section eighty five read by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section eighty six of the story of greece told to boys and girls this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by christine rutger january twelfth twenty twenty two westford massachusetts the story of greece by mary mcgregor Isites tries to slay Timoleon. The small band of Corinthians who now held the citadel of Syracuse was closely besieged by Isites, but soon he grew tired of waiting for it to surrender and hit, as he thought, on a quicker way of driving the enemy out of the island. Without Timoleon, he would not fear the Corinthians, so he resolved to get rid of him without delay. He hired two foreign soldiers and sent them to Adranum with orders to kill the general. Timoleon went about without a bodyguard, as Isotes knew. When the assassins reached the city, he was in the temple, sacrificing to the gods, for it was a festival. With their daggers hidden beneath their cloaks, the men slipped in among the crowd of worshippers and were soon standing together close to the altar. As they hesitated to strike the fatal blow, a sword flashed out from behind, and one of them fell slain to the ground. His companion, in his terror, forgot to kill Timoleon, and laid hold of the altar lest he too should be slain by an unseen foe. 
when his terror grew a little less he did not try to obey isotee's orders but begged timoleon to spare his life and he would tell him everything timoleon promised that his life should be safe and then the miserable man confessed that he and his friend had been hired by isotee's to kill the corinthian general meanwhile the stranger who had killed one of the assassins had fled to the top of a great precipice that overlooked the city here he was captured and as he was hurried before timoleon he told the guards that the man he had slain was one who years before had killed his father he pleaded that he had done right to punish the evildoer it may be that the corinthians and the citizens of adrenum agreed with their prisoner in any case they were so grateful that he had saved the life of timoleon that they gave him a gift of money and set him free as the attack on timoleon had failed the carthaginians thought they would try to frighten the citadel of syracuse into surrendering so they decked the mass of their ships with wreaths and hung grecian shields over the sides of their vessels then with shouts of victory they sailed toward the harbor from the citadel the garrison saw the ships and heard the shouts but it was not so easily deceived as mago the general of the carthaginians had expected the corinthians were sure that timoleon would have managed to let them know had he been defeated so they laughed at the enemy's trick and stayed safe within their walls soon after this the reinforcements sent from corinth joined timoleon and he then marched to syracuse mago had already begun to doubt the loyalty of isotes he feared that he was trying to make terms with timoleon when a little later he saw the soldiers of both generals talking together in a friendly way as they fished for eels in the marshes near to the city he grew more suspicious day by day his fears grew until at length in a panic he ordered his troops to embark and set sail for africa the very day after mago had deserted his post timoleon himself reached syracuse he looked at the empty harbor where was the enemy not a single carthaginian vessel was to be seen when timoleon learned how mago had fled he laughed at his cowardice and still laughing he offered a reward to anyone who would tell him where the carthaginians had hidden but although mago had fled isotes and his men still held the city but the wisdom of timoleon and the valor of his troops soon put them to flight and without the loss of one of the corinthian soldiers the city was taken this wonderful success was said by everyone to be due to the good fortune that followed all that timoleon undertook the citizens of syracuse thought that timoleon would now make himself tyrant to their surprise as well as to their joy he proclaimed that they themselves were to govern the city he ordered the public crier to go through the streets bidding all those who were willing to come with pickaxe and hammer to pull down the citadel which dionysus had built the people did not need to be asked twice with right good will they destroyed not only the citadel but the palaces in which the tyrants of syracuse had dwelt and while they pulled down the walls flutes sounded and women danced and sang on the places where the palaces had stood timoleon ordered courts of justice to be built so neglected and forsaken had the city been during the rule of the tyrants as well as during the siege that grass was growing in the marketplace grass enough to feed the soldiers horses all over sicily cities had been deserted and in some of them deer and wild boars wandered up and down the streets timoleon saw that if the island was to grow prosperous again those who had fled must be brought back and new citizens must come and settle in the different cities so he sent to corinth to ask her to send out colonists to the island this she did 
and she also sent vessels to Asia to bring back to their island home those who had taken refuge there. Soon 60,000 citizens were added to the inhabitants of Sicily. End of chapter 86. Chapter 87 of The Story of Greece Told to Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker, January 12, 2022, Westford, Massachusetts. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. The Battle of Crimisus. The exiles who had returned to Sicily and the colonists who had come to settle there were needed not only to till the ground, but to defend the island. For the Carthaginians, angry with Mago's failure, now sent to Sicily an enormous army, 70,000 strong. Syracusans were frightened to see so large a force, and not more than 3,000 men were willing to go with Timoleon against the enemy. He hired 4,000 soldiers, but of these, 1,000 deserted before a battle was fought. Near the river Crimisus, the Carthaginians encamped, and thither Timoleon hastened with his faint-hearted army. On their way, they met a number of mules laden with baskets of parsley. Now the Sicilians were used to place wreaths of parsley upon the tombs of their dead, so they were sure that it was a bad omen to meet the mules, and they grew still more uneasy. But Timoleon laughed at their fears, telling them that in Corinth the victors at the games were crowned with chaplets of parsley. He then lifted some from the baskets, and twisting it into a wreath, he placed it on his head, his officers first, and then the soldiers following his example. At that moment, two eagles flew toward the army. One carried in its talons a snake, which it had killed. The other uttered loud cries as of victory. Here was a good omen. It was ever a sign of success to see an eagle, and the soldiers thanked the gods and plucked up courage. Before long, Timoleon led his men to the top of a hill that looked down on the river Crimisus. But at first he could see nothing, for a thick mist veiled the river. The hill was still hidden from sight when the mist lifted from the river, and Timoleon saw that the Carthaginians had begun to cross to the other side, but they had no idea that the enemy was near. Now was the time, thought Timoleon, to charge the enemy while it was crossing the river. So bidding the trumpets sound, he seized his shield and ordered his troops to advance. The courage of the men had returned, and with cheers they rushed down the hill and charged the Carthaginians, who, taken by surprise, yet fought bravely. They wore heavy armor, and their breastplates were able to resist the thrust of the Corinthian spears. Soon the men were at close quarters with swords drawn, and a terrible struggle began. It seemed that now one side, now the other would conquer. While the victory still hung in the balance, a violent storm broke over the battlefield. The thunder crashed so that the orders of the officers could no longer be heard. Lightning flashed in the eyes of the startled horses and blinded them, while torrents of rain and hail dashed in the faces of the Carthaginians. As the ground grew muddy, the soldiers slipped and fell to the ground. The Sicilians, who wore light armor, easily struggled to their feet, but their foes found it almost impossible to rise. Soon the river overflowed its banks and swept across the battlefield. This was more than the Carthaginians could bear, and they turned and fled, but many were overtaken by the swift-footed Sicilians and slain. The victorious army found more spoil than they had thought possible. A thousand breastplates and ten thousand shields of marvelous workmanship, as well as ornaments of gold and silver, were taken. 
when tidings were sent to Corinth of the great victory of Crimesis, the richest of the spoil was also sent to the city. On the booty were written these words, The people of Corinth and Timoleon, their general, having redeemed the Greeks of Sicily from Carthaginian bondage, make oblation of these to the gods in grateful acknowledgment of their favor. Sicily was now free, and the people in their gratitude begged Timoleon to become their king. But this he would not do, nor would he even keep the command of the army. His wife and children, whom he had left in Corinth, joined him, and for a time he lived with them in Syracuse as quiet as any other citizen. When he left the city, it was to live in a beautiful country house, which was given to him by the grateful people of Syracuse. As he grew older, Timoleon's eyesight failed, and at length he became quite blind. But old and blind as he was, the people did not forget all that he had done for them, and they loved and trusted him as in happier days. If trouble arose in the assembly, they would beg him to come to give them his advice, and the old man would order his car, which was drawn by mules, and be driven to the hall. Here he would sit and listen to the troubles of the people, and when he spoke, it was seldom that his words were not obeyed. Three or four years after the battle at Crimesis, Timoleon died. The grief of the Syracusans was deep, for they had loved their deliverer well. Thousands of men and women, clad in white and crowned with garlands, followed his body as it was carried slowly through the city, past the places where once the palaces of the tyrants had stood. As the bier was laid on the funeral pile, a herald cried aloud, The people of Syracuse entered Timoleon, the Corinthian, at the public expense, and decree that his memory be honored forever, by games held each year, the prizes to be competed for in music, in horse races, and all sorts of bodily exercises, and this because he suppressed tyrants, overthrew the barbarian, replenished the principalities that were desolate with new inhabitants, and then restored the Sicilian Greeks to the privilege of living by their own laws. End of chapter 87「Chapter 88 of the Story of Greece told to boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor Demosthenes Wishes to Become an Orator Demosthenes, the great Athenian orator, was born in 384 B.C. He was a shy and delicate boy, and often stammered when he spoke. Some of his companions were cruel enough to laugh at him, and even to imitate a stammer so he would often slip away from his playmates, but when they saw that he did not join in their games, they but laughed at him the more. The father of Demosthenes was a rich man. He died when his little son was seven years old, leaving his fortune to his child. But the guardians who took charge of Demosthenes and his wealth were careless and dishonest men. Some of the boys' money they lost, some they spent on themselves. As the child grew older, his guardians found that there was little money left to use for his education. They could not afford to get the best teachers, nor did they pay well those whom they employed, so that Demosthenes was often taught carelessly, or not at all. Of the boy's mother we are told little, save that she was kind to her delicate little son and tended him with care, but she too died while he was still young. Demosthenes did not learn his lessons well or quickly, but he was interested in all that went on around him, and he soon began to distrust his guardians. Long before he was sixteen years old, he knew that they had lost his money, and even then he hoped that some day he would be able to punish them. The boy loved the beautiful city of Athens in which he grew up. Never did he tire of gazing at the wonderful temples, the noble statues which made a renown throughout Greece. There were in these, as in other days, famous orators in Athens, to whom the citizens were ever eager to listen. 
for they were well pleased to be reminded of the glorious days of Thermopylae and of Marathon, though now they were not anxious to win glory on the battlefield. They had grown rich and indolent, and were content to stay at home, content to go to games and to theatres. Demosthenes often heard his teachers talk of the great orators of Athens, and he wished that he might listen to their eloquent speeches. One day, Callistratus, a famous orator, was to speak at a great trial that was taking place in the city. The boy begged to be allowed to go, and his tutor, at length, agreed to find a corner in the hall where the boy might sit to see and to hear all that went on. Demosthenes could imagine no greater treat than to be there, hidden away in the midst of the crowd, to listen to Callistratus. The speech was a great one, and when it was over, the Athenians crowded round the orator, eager to applaud, while many followed him to his home. Demosthenes came away with his ambition roused. He said to himself, I too will be an orator, and make the people do as I wish. They shall applaud me, even as they have applauded Callistratus today. But another reason that made him wish to speak in public was that he might expose the dishonesty of his guardians in the law courts, for he could not be content until they were punished. When the boy had made up his mind to be an orator, he lost no time in beginning to study. He knew that he must work hard if he would succeed. For two years he read history, wrote speeches, and, when it was possible, went to hear famous orators. When he was eighteen, he thought that he was ready to speak in public. So he went to the law courts and accused his guardians of theft. At first, little notice was taken of what the lad said, but he pleaded his cause again and again, until at length he won his suit, and his guardians were punished. But it was too late to recover the money, which was now nearly all lost. End of chapter 88「Chapter eighty nine of the Story of Greece told to Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. Demosthenes, the greatest orator of Athens. Demosthenes had spoken in the law courts, but he was not content. His great ambition now was to speak in the assembly of Athens. He wished to remind the Athenians of their glorious past. He wished to encourage them to fight against the enemies of their country. His first attempt was a failure. His voice was weak, his sentences long, and before he had finished what he wished to say, the people were laughing and jeering, so that he was forced to sit down. As he left the assembly, he was so unhappy that he thought he would never speak to the people again. He walked along the streets, scarcely knowing, in his distress, where he went. Suddenly, he felt someone touch his arm, and looking up, he saw a very old man who had been in the assembly and had heard him speak. He had seen how disappointed Demosthenes was as he left the hall, and he had determined to encourage him. So first, he praised a crestfallen orator, saying that his speech had reminded him of the great orator Pericles, and then he upbraided the young man for being so easily discouraged by the laughter of the people. Demosthenes allowed himself to be comforted and made up his mind to try again, thinking that perhaps after all he would be able to make the people listen to him. But in spite of all his efforts, he could not hold their attention, and he left the assembly, hiding his face in his cloak that none might see his sorrow. An actor named Satyrus, who knew him well, followed him home, for he guessed that Demosthenes would be in despair. The orator did not hide his trouble from his friend. The citizens will listen to anyone, even to those who have not studied, rather than to me, he said in bitter anger. A sailor with a foolish story will make them applaud, while if I tell them tales of the glorious deeds of their own countrymen, they pay no heed. You say true, Demosthenes, answered Satyrus, but I will soon tell you how this is, if you will recite to me some lines from one of our great poets. Demosthenes did as his friend asked, but although he said the words correctly, his voice was dull, and his attitude was stiff and awkward. Satyrus said nothing when his friend ended, but himself began to repeat the same lines. Yet you would scarcely have known that they were the same, for the eyes of the actor flashed, his voice rang clear, then sank to a whisper. His body swayed now this way, now that, as he sought to make the meaning of the poem plain. Then Demosthenes understood, 
as he had never done before, how it was that his carefully studied speeches did not interest the Athenians. He must not only read or recite them, he must act them, so that the things of which he spoke might become real to those who listened. From that day, Demosthenes began to work in a different way. He made one of the cellars of his house into a study, that there, undisturbed, he might practice his voice and gestures. He stayed in this strange study for two or three months at a time, and lest he should be tempted to go to theatres or games, he shaved one side of his head, that so for shame he might not go abroad, though he desired it ever so much. At other times, to strengthen his voice, he would go to the seashore while a storm was raging, and putting pebbles in his mouth, he would try to make his words heard above the roar of the waves. He also recited speeches while he was out of breath from running up some steep hill, and at home, he would stand before a large mirror to watch his gestures and the expression of his face. And his hard work and perseverance were rewarded, for Demosthenes became what he most desired to be, the greatest orator of Athens. His enemies learned to fear his speeches, his friends account upon them to aid their cause. Demosthenes was thirty-three years of age when he made his first speech against Philip of Macedon, who now, in 356 B.C., invaded Greece. The king would gladly have made an alliance with the Athenians and gained their goodwill, but they, wishing to recover Amphipolis, which he had taken from them, refused to make peace. Demosthenes lost no opportunity to speak against Philip. He reminded his countrymen that the king was not the man to rest content with that he has subdued, but is always adding to his conquests, and casts a snare around us while we sit at home postponing. In another speech, he told the Athenians that they chose their captains not to fight, but to be displayed like dolls in the marketplace. These and other speeches against the king of Macedon were called the Philippics of Demosthenes, and still today, if someone makes a speech against a special person, although his name is not Philip, we call the speech a Philippic. End of chapter 89「Section 90 of the Story of Greece, told to boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caden B. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. The Sacred War. Philip of Macedon began to reign in 359 BC. When he was 16 years of age, he was taken by Pelopidas as a hostage to Thebes. Here he stayed for three years, reading Greek literature and learning to love it, studying Greek art and learning to admire it. The craft of war he gained from the great Theban general Epaminondas. When Philip went back to Macedon as king, he trained his army in the movements he had first seen used by the Theban troops under their famous general. At this time, a war called the Sacred War was going on in Greece. Delphi, where the Temple of Apollo stood, had been seized by the Phocians, who were led by a bold commander named Philomelus. The home of the Phocians was near Mount Parnassus. In the temple, vast treasures had been stored. These, said Philomelus, should be safe as of old. But when he fortified the city and brought a large army of soldiers to guard it, the other Greek states said it was time to interfere, that Delphi must be taken from the Phocians. Philomelus at once resolved to increase his army, but he had no money to pay more soldiers. The Phocians had already spent all that they possessed on the war, and the citizens of Delphi had been so heavily taxed that they could give no more. Money Philomelus must have! So he began to borrow from the treasures of the temple, which he had promised should be untouched. As the war went on, he took more gold, more of the sacred treasures, none of which he was able to replace. When the Thebans and their allies met Philomelus, he and his hired troops were soon put to flight. Philomelus fled alone to the top of a precipice, pursued by the enemy. He must either leap into the awful abyss or be captured by the angry soldiers. In a moment, he made his choice, and when the Thebans reached the spot where he had been seen but a second before, he was no longer there. But other leaders replaced Philomelus, and they too rifled the Temple of Apollo. At length, the Phocians grew so bold that they determined to attack Philip of Macedon, who had invaded Thessaly, and drive him from Greek territory. They forced the king to return to Macedon, but he soon came back with a large army, and the Phocians retreated to the famous pass of Thermopylae. They hoped that Athens would help them to hold the pass against Philip, but in spite of the Philippics of Demosthenes, she did nothing. 
Alone, the Phocians were not strong enough to resist Philip's attack, and they were forced to surrender. The pass, which the king had long resolved to gain, was in his hand. When the Athenians heard of the disaster, they were dismayed, and when Demosthenes again urged them to take up arms against the invaders, his appeal was not made in vain. In August 338 BC, the united army of Athenians and Thebans marched against the Macedonians and met them in the plain of Chaeronea, where a great battle was fought. Philip's famous son Alexander, who was then only 18 years old, was in command of one of the wings of the Macedonian army. Young as he was, it was his attack upon the sacred band of Thebans that determined the battle. The sacred band fought to the last and was cut down where it stood. Soon the rest of the Greek army fled from the fatal field, Demosthenes, who was among the foot soldiers, taking flight with his comrades. On the roadside, not far from the town of Chaeronea and near to Thebes, is a tomb where the fallen heroes of the sacred band were laid. Standing over the tomb is a statue of a lion, now partly in ruins, which was placed there as though to protect the bodies of the slain. The victory of Philip at Chaeronea left Athens, and indeed all Greece, at the mercy of the king, and he treated her well. His chief ambition was to conquer the kingdom of Persia, and the army he meant to lead against the great king was to be made up of Greeks as well as of Macedonians. But in 336 BC, before his plans could be carried out, Philip was murdered. When Greece heard the tidings, she rejoiced, for now again she hoped to be free. None was more glad than Demosthenes, for he, as you know, had always been a bitter enemy of the king. The orator was wearing black clothes at the time, because he had but lately lost his daughter. When he heard that Philip had been murdered, he put them away and clad himself in gay garments while he placed a wreath upon his head. Only one Athenian was found to reprove the Athenians for their hasty and foolish joy. Phocian, who was both a general and an orator, said gravely, Nothing shows greater meanness of spirit than expressions of joy at the death of an enemy. Remember that the army you fought at Chaeronea is lessened by only one man. End of section 90. Section 91 of The Story of Greece, Told to Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caden B. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. Alexander and Bucephalus. Alexander, the son of Philip of Macedon, became king in 336 BC. The queen mother adored her brave son and dreamed of the great things he would do when he became a man. She did all she could to awake his ambition, telling him that he was descended from Achilles, the hero of Troy, and bidding him, when he was older, to strive to do nobler deeds than his great ancestor had done. One of his tutors called the young prince Achilles, while he named himself Phoenix, after the tutor of the old Greek hero. The Iliad of Homer, which tells of the deeds of Achilles, Alexander knew by heart. When he was a man, he always carried a copy with him on his campaigns. It is said that he slept with it as well as his sword beneath his pillow. Alexander might also have been a Spartan boy, so simple was his training. He learned to ride, to race, to swim, but he never cared to wrestle as did most lads of his time, nor would he offer prizes for such contests at the game which were held each year. When the prince was asked if he would run in the Olympic Games, for he was fleet of foot, he answered, Yes, if I could have kings to race with me. Even as a lad, he was eager to win glory, and when he heard of a great victory gained by his royal father, or of a town that had been subdued by him, he was more sorry than glad, and said to his companions, My father will make so many conquests that there will be nothing left for me to win. One day, while Alexander was still a boy, a Greek from Thessaly arrived at the court of Macedon, bringing with him a noble horse named Bucephalus, which he offered to sell for 2,600 pounds. Philip went with his son and his courtiers to look at the horse and to test its powers, but when anyone approached or tried to mount, Bucephalus reared and kicked and became so unmanageable that the king, growing angry, bade the Thessalian take the animal away. The prince had been watching the horse keenly, and as he was being led away, the lad exclaimed, what an excellent horse do they lose for want of skill and courage to manage him. Philip heard what his son said, but at first he took no notice of his words. But when the prince said the same thing again and again, he looked at Alexander and saw that he was really sorry that the horse was being sent away. Then, half mocking, the king said, 
Do you reproach those who are older than yourself as if you knew more and were better able to manage him than they? I could manage the horse better than others have done, answered the prince. And if you fail, what will you forfeit? asked the king. I will pay the whole price of the horse, said Alexander quickly. The courtiers laughed at the confidence of the prince, but paying no attention to them, he ran towards the horse and seizing the bridle turned Bucephalus so that he faced the sun. For the prince had noticed that the steed was afraid of his own shadow as it flitted backward and forward with his every movement. After speaking quietly to the horse and patting him, the prince flung aside the mantle he was wearing and nibbly mounted on his back. Using neither whip nor spur, he let the animal choose his own pace, and Bucephalus was content to go at a quiet trot. Gradually, Alexander urged him on to a gallop with voice and spur. As the pace grew quicker and quicker, the king looked on in fear lest the lad should be thrown, but when he saw that the horse was well under control and that Alexander had turned and was coming back, he burst into tears of joy while the courtiers loudly applauded the prince. As he leaped from the horse, Philip kissed him and said, O oh, my son, look thee out a kingdom equal to and worthy of thyself, for Macedon is too little for thee. Soon after this, the king sent for a famous philosopher named Aristotle to teach his son. Alexander was quick to learn, and his eager interest in his studies pleased Aristotle. In after days, when the prince had become a king and was adding kingdom after kingdom to his possessions, he wrote to his old tutor, I assure you I had rather excel others in the knowledge of what is excellent than in the extent of my power and dominions. When Philip was murdered, Alexander was twenty years of age, a stripling, Demosthenes said, making light of his youth. But had Demosthenes known the character of the prince, he would not have spoken thus slightingly of his years. The orator not only rejoiced when Philip was murdered, but he urged the people to rouse themselves and throw off the yoke of Macedon. The old days when the Athenians would not listen to Demosthenes were long past. Now his matchless eloquence could hold them spellbound, even when they refused to be guided by his advice. But in Athens, as in many other cities, discontent had long been smoldering, and fanned by his words, it broke out into a blaze. The young king found that he must put down rebellion in Greece before he set out, as he wished to do, to conquer Persia. End of section 91. Section 92 of The Story of Greece, Told to Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caden B. The Story of Greece by Mary MacGregor, Alexander and Diogenes. When Alexander marched at the head of his army into Thessaly, not a blow was struck. His presence seemed enough to gain the allegiance of the Thessalians. The king then went to Corinth, where ambassadors from many of the Greek states met him. Young as he was, they chose Alexander to be general over the Greek troops, which were to go with the Macedonians to invade Asia. Everyone in Corinth was eager to see the king. From the surrounding towns, too, the people crowded into the city, that they might look at the young monarch who was going to lead their soldiers on so great an expedition. They did not dream of all that he would do, how he would spread their customs, their language, their culture over Asia first and then over all the world, but looking at him, they knew that he would be a conqueror. Among those who wished to see Alexander were many philosophers and great men, but one strange philosopher called Diogenes showed no interest in the king. Alexander heard of this man, who was said to sit all day in a tub or barrel. As Diogenes did not come to see him, he resolved to go to see Diogenes. He found the philosopher outside the gates of Corinth, sitting in a tub which was placed so that the rays of the sun fell upon him. When the philosopher saw the king and the courtiers who accompanied him, he roused himself from his meditations and looked at the young sovereign. Alexander spoke kindly to him and asked if there was anything he wished. Yes, answered Diogenes, I would have you not stand between me and the sun. The courtiers were indignant at such an answer, but Alexander laughed, and being pleased with the philosopher's indifference to his rank, he said to them, If I were not Alexander, I should like to be Diogenes. Soon after this, the king, believing that he had secured the fealty of Greece, went back to Macedon. In the spring of 335 BC, he hoped to set out to invade Asia. But the wild tribes on the borders of Macedon began to be restless, and the king was forced to subdue these foes nearer home before he went to Asia. While he was driving them beyond his borders, a rumor that he was dead reached Greece. 
If Alexander was dead, it was a good chance, thought the Thebans, to drive the Macedonians from their citadel, and without waiting to find out if the rumor was true, they revolted. Demosthenes tried to persuade the Athenians to go to the help of the Thebans, but although his eloquence moved them, it had no power to make them act. The Thebans soon found to their cost that Alexander was not dead. He was indeed on his way to Greece to punish them for revolting. Outside the walls of their city he halted, so that the citizens might submit, if so they willed. But they, still dreaming of liberty, refused to surrender. Then Alexander attacked the city and captured it with little difficulty. He determined to give the other cities in Greece a lesson by punishing the rebels severely, so he pulled down their houses and utterly destroyed their town, leaving untouched only the temples and a house in which a great poet named Pindar had dwelt. Demosthenes was bitterly disappointed that the Athenians had not sent to help the Thebans. He feared, too, that Alexander would now march against Athens and destroy her as he had destroyed Thebes. But the king only sent to demand that eight of the orators who had done their best to incite the people to rebel against him should be sent to him as hostages. Demosthenes would have been among the eight, and he urged the Athenians not to hand over their sheepdogs to the wolf, but Phocian said that it would be wise to do as Alexander asked. At length, the assembly sent Democles to the king to plead the cause of his comrades, for he was, after Demosthenes, the greatest orator in Athens. Alexander listened to Democles and was persuaded to leave the orators in their own city, for he believed that the fate of the Thebes would make Athens afraid to rebel. Of the loyalty of the Greek troops, the king was sure, for were they not going to avenge the invasion of Greece by Xerxes? The king did not mean to return to Macedon to reign, rather did he dream of a throne in one of the great cities which he was going to conquer. So before he marched away, he divided his royal domain and his wealth among his friends. Perdiccas, one of his friends, was dismayed at the generosity of the king and asked him what he was keeping for himself. Hope, answered Alexander. Then Perdiccas refused to accept his share of the king's gifts, saying, We who go forth to fight with you need share only in your hope. Antipater, one of his father's generals, Alexander left in Macedon to look after his kingdom. At length in the spring of 334 BC, after saying goodbye to his mother, whom he dearly loved, the king marched with an enormous force to the Hellespont and crossed it. The great expedition had really begun. End of section 92. Section 93 of The Story of Greece Told to Boys and Girls this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caden B. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. The Battle of Geronicus. Before Alexander crossed the Hellespont, he had seen that the opposite shore was held by his Macedonians, while the army landed himself sailed to the harbor of the Achaeans. Midway in the strait, he took a golden dish in his hand and flung from it an offering to Poseidon and to the Nereids. It is said that the king himself steered the ship in which he sailed to the Mycenaean shore. Crossing the plain of Troy, the king climbed the hill of Ilion, and here in a forsaken little town he found a temple to Athene, to whom he offered sacrifice. He left his own armor in the temple, taking in its place an ancient suit that had once been hung upon the walls, a trophy of war. On the tomb of his ancestor Achilles, he laid a garland, while Hephaestion, his beloved friend, placed one on the grave of Patroclus. The old Greek stories had entered into the very fiber of the young king, and in this way he did honor, as he deemed, to his glorious ancestor. He felt ready now to do deeds as great as his hero had done. When Alexander rejoined his army, it had advanced to the river Granicus, and there, on the opposite bank, was a great force under Darius, king of Persia. Alexander would have to conquer this great host before he could advance into Asia. One of his officers, named Parmenio, begged the king to wait to cross the river until early the next morning, when the enemy would not be drawn up in battle array. I should be ashamed, answered the king, having crossed the Hellespont to be detained by a miserable stream like the Granicus. He then ordered the army to advance and himself dashed into the river, followed by his horse guards. The Granicus was not a river to be despised, for the current was strong and the horses kept their feet with difficulty. A storm of arrows was poured upon the struggling horses and their riders, and it seemed as though the attempt to cross in the face of the foe would be useless. But the king refused to be daunted, and the soldiers followed their intrepid leader until at length they reached the opposite bank. But to clamber up the bank was no easy matter. The sides of the river were slippery, 
and the horses having no firm foothold stumbled and fell. Only after great and repeated efforts did Alexander and those who followed him reach the top of the bank. Wet and exhausted, they had no time to form their ranks before the Persians dashed upon them. A desperate hand-to-hand -hand fight was at once begun. The enemy was quick to notice Alexander, for he wore a large plume of white feathers in his helmet, while his buckler was more splendid than any of his soldiers. Two Persian officers, wishing to win the glory of having killed the king, attacked him together. One of them, riding close to Alexander, rose in his stirrups and brought his battle axe down with all his strength upon the helmet of the king. So fierce was the blow that the crest was torn away along with one of the plumes while the axe cut its way through the helmet until the edge touched Alexander's hair. Again, the officer raised his axe, but ere he could strike, Clytus, the foster brother of Alexander, slew the officer with his sword and the king was saved. The famous phalanx of the Macedonians now threw itself upon the enemy, and the Persians tried in vain to repel the fierceness of the attack. Soon the whole army was put to flight, all save a band of Greek soldiers who were fighting for Darius. These withdrew to a height above the battlefield and sent to Alexander to ask for quarter, but the king refused their request and ordered his men to attack the little company. The Greeks fought desperately, and Alexander lost more men in this struggle than he had lost in all the rest of the battle. His horse, which was not the famous Bucephalus, was killed on the field. While in this great battle, fought in 334 BC on the banks of the Granicus, the Persians lost a great number of men. Only 34 Macedonians, it is said, were slain. The spoil was enormous, and Alexander determined that the Greeks should have a generous share. To Athens, he sent 300 Persian bucklers to be offered to Athene, with these words inscribed, Alexander, son of Philip, and the Grecians, except the Lacedaemonians, won these from the barbarians who inhabit Asia. Athens accepted the king's offering to their goddess, but they churlishly refused to send ships to help him to conquer the coast towns which he must now attack. While dividing the spoil of the Grenicus, Alexander did not forget his mother. To her he sent all of the plate he had taken, as well as beautiful cloth of wonderful purple dye. For himself he kept but little. End of section 93. Section 94 of the Story of Greece Told to Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caden B. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. The Gordian Knot. After the Battle of Granicus, many Persian towns submitted to the conqueror. Those along the coast of Asia Minor that refused to open their gates, the king quickly subdued. During the winter, he reached a city called Gordian, about which a strange story is told. In the citadel of Gordian was an old, roughly built wagon, which had once belonged to a peasant named Gordius. Long, long ago, Gordius had ridden into the town in his wagon, and the oracle had declared that this peasant had been chosen by the gods to be the king of Phrygia, in which country Gordian stood. When Gordius was made king, almost the first thing he did was to dedicate his wagon to the gods, tying the yoke to the pole with fiber taken from the bark of a tree. The Gordian Knot, as it was named, was twisted and tangled in a bewildering way and was looked as though it would defy the most skillful fingers to untie. Yet an oracle had said that whoever should succeed in undoing this wonderful knot would become king over all Asia. Many men who wished to wear a crown came to Gordian to try to undo the knot, but not one of them had been able to unravel the twisted fiber. When Alexander, with his victorious army, rode into Gordian, everyone wondered if the king would be able to untie the famous knot. Alexander was not long in going to see the ancient wagon. He looked at the puzzling knot and soon saw that he would not be able to untie it. But he did not mean to be beaten. He would solve the puzzle in his own way. So taking his sword in his impatient hands, with one swift stroke, he cut the formidable knot in two. The onlookers, both Phrygians and Macedonians, shouted with delight, for lo, the oracle was fulfilled and Alexander would become monarch of Asia. As the knot was cut in twain, a great thunderstorm raged over the town, and the people said, It is Zeus who sends the storm to show that he is pleased that the prophecy is fulfilled. While Alexander had been conquering the towns along the coast of Asia, Darius had been gathering together another great army which numbered, so it was said, 600,000 men. The king himself commanded the vast army, and in the spring of 333 BC he set out to find Alexander. Darius was not a skillful general, nor was he a brave king, but he had no doubt that he would conquer Alexander. 
When Alexander still lingered in one of the coast towns, Darius deemed it that it was cowardice that kept him there, so little did he know of the character of his foe. It was illness alone that kept Alexander from advancing against the great king. Some said that it was the hardships of the battlefield that had made the king ill, others that while he was still heated after a long march he had bathed in a river, the waters of which were very cold. To the dismay of his soldiers, who adored their brave leader, the king grew worse and worse. He was so ill that it seemed that he must die. His physicians were afraid to give the king medicine, for should he die they would be accused of giving him poison. At length, one of the physicians, named Philip, to whom Alexander had shown great kindness, determined that whatever happened to him, he would do his utmost to save the king's life. Alexander himself was content to take what Philip ordered, so impatient was he to be well and at the head of his army once again. So Philip left the king for a few moments to prepare the medicine that he believed would cure him. While he was absent, a letter was brought to Alexander from his officer Parmenio. It besought the king not to trust Philip, as he had been bribed by Darius to poison him. Vast sums of money and the hand of the great king's daughter, said Parmenio, were to be the reward of the physician. When Alexander had read the letter, he put it under his pillow, showing it to no one, not even to his beloved friend Hephaestion. He had no sooner done so than Philip returned with the medicine. The king took it without hesitation. Then, drawing the letter from beneath his pillow, he bade his physician read it. Philip was horrified as he read the false accusation, and flinging himself down by the bed, he entreated the king to trust him and to fear nothing. The drug was a powerful one, and after taking it, the king was unconscious for hours. His nurses whispered to one another that he was dead. But after a time, he opened his eyes, weak indeed, but no longer in danger. Philip tended him until his strength returned, and he was at length able to go out to show himself to his Macedonians, for they had been in constant fear lest aught should befall their king, and nothing would satisfy them until they had seen his face. End of section 94. Chapter 95 of the Story of Greece Told to Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Elizabeth Horan. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. Darius Gallops from the Battlefield. As soon as he had recovered from his illness, Alexander led his army to meet Darius. He found the great king in the Pass of Issus in October 333 BC. Darius had first encamped on the plain of Issus in a strong position, where his vast army would have had room to fight. But he dreamed that Alexander would try to escape him, so he ordered his men to march through the narrow mountain passes to meet the enemy. A Macedonian, who had deserted, begged Darius not to leave the plain. But, said the king, if I stay here, Alexander will escape me. That fear is needless, answered the Macedonian, for assure yourself that far from avoiding you, he will make all speed to meet you, and is now most likely on his march toward you. When Alexander knew that Darius had left the plain for the pass of Issus, he was pleased, for he knew that the enemy would now be hemmed in between the mountains and the sea. Before long, the two armies were close together. Alexander led his right wing against the left wing of the Persians. Here he was soon victorious, and free to attack the center of the enemy, where Darius sat in his chariot, surrounded by a band of Persian nobles. As the great king saw Alexander and his followers drawing nearer and nearer, he began to grow afraid. Soon he could bear his fears no longer, and leaping from his chariot, he mounted a horse and fled from the field. When the Persians saw that their king had fled, they stayed to fight no longer. Even the cavalry, which had withstood every attack, now wavered, then broke, and fled with the rest. The great hosts sought to hide themselves from their pursuers among the mountain passes, but thousands were captured and slain. Darius, in his haste, had left his shield and his royal cloak behind, but he would not stay to recover them. On and on he fled until he reached a town on the river Euphrates. Alexander was well pleased with his great victory, but he would fain have captured the Persian king. To a wound in his thigh he paid little attention, nor did it prove dangerous, but it made it impossible for him to overtake Darius. When the king returned from the pursuit of his enemy, he found his men pillaging the Persian camp. The tent of Darius, which was beautifully furnished, and which also had a great store of gold and silver, was set apart for Alexander himself. 
Let us now cleanse ourselves from the toils of war in the baths of Darius, said the king as he entered the tent of the defeated monarch. Not so, answered one of his followers, but in Alexander's rather, for the property of the conquered is and should be called the conqueror's. Alexander's early training had been simple as that of a Spartan, and the luxury of the great king's tents amazed him. In one there were numerous baths and many boxes of ointment, in another a table spread for a magnificent feast. As Alexander looked at it all, he turned to his followers and said, This, it seems, is royalty. But his early training still influenced him, and he kept his simple tastes and cared little for dainty fare or other luxuries. Once a queen to whom Alexander had been kind sent to his tent day by day some of the dishes which had been prepared for her own table, and at length, that he might always fare well, she sent cooks and bakers. But the king would not accept them, for he said that his old tutor had given him the best possible cooks. They were a night march to prepare for breakfast, and a moderate breakfast to create an appetite for supper. He told the queen, too, how when he was a boy, his tutor Leonidas used to look often in his wardrobe, lest his clothes were too fine, and in his room, to see that his mother had not given him cushions for his couch, or soft pillows for his bed. As Alexander sat down to supper on the evening of the victory of Issus, the sound of wailing and weeping fell upon his ear. It seemed to him as the weeping of women, and he demanded to be told at once who was in trouble. His officers said that it was the mother and wife and children of Darius who were weeping, for they had heard that Alexander had returned with their lord's shield and cloak, and they thought that he must have been slain. Then the king bade one of his followers go tell the royal mourners that Darius lived, and that they need fear no harm from Alexander. For he made war upon Darius, not because he bore him ill will, but because he wished to gain his dominions. He promised that he would provide them with all the comforts which they had been used to receive from the great king. When Darius was safe beyond the Euphrates, he remembered that his wife and mother had been left to the mercy of his conqueror. So he wrote to Alexander, begging that they might be sent to him, and offering to make a treaty with the king. Here is part of the proud answer that Alexander sent to Darius. I am lord of all, Darius, he wrote, and therefore do thou come to me with thy requests. Thou hast only to come to me to ask and receive thy mother and wife and children, and whatever else thou mayest desire. And for the future, whenever thou sendest, send to me as to the great king of Asia, and do not write as to an equal, but tell me whatever thy need be, as to one who is lord of all that is thine. Otherwise I will deal with thee as with an offender. But if thou disputest the kingdom, then wait and fight for it again, and do not flee, for I will march against thee wheresoever thou mayest be. End of chapter 95《Chapter 96 of the Story of Greece, Told to Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Elizabeth Horan. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. Tear is Stormed by Alexander. Alexander did not cross the Euphrates in search of Darius. He knew that the great king could do him no harm, even should he again assemble a large army. So for a time he left Darius to do as he pleased, while he himself went on with his own plan. Nearly all the towns in Syracuse were ready to open their gates to Alexander. Some that had found Darius a hard master hailed him as a deliverer. Tyr alone, while saying that she was ready to do as the king willed, refused to receive either a Persian or Macedonian into the city. Alexander wished to offer sacrifice to the deity of Tyr, whose temple was within the city, and when the people refused to open their gates, he was so angry that he had once laid siege to the town. Tyr stood on an island about half a mile from the mainland. Near the coast the water was shallow, while close to the walls of the city it was deep. The Tyrians believed that they could hold their city against Alexander, for the walls were built high on the top of a steep and dangerous cliff. As the king had no fleet, he could not attack the city until he had built a causeway from the mainland to the island, so he ordered his men to begin the work without delay. But when the causeway stretched almost to the island, 
The Tyrians did all that they could to hinder the workmen. They sent among them showers of arrows, and hurled down upon them great pieces of rock, so that they found it impossible to complete the causeway. But the king was not easily beaten. He ordered the men to build towers along the causeway, and to tie leather screens from one tower to another, so that they might be protected from the arrows and missiles of the enemy. Then the Tyrians dragged a ship, loaded with dry wood, as near to the causeway as they dared to venture, and set it on fire. The towers were soon in flames, and while the Macedonians tried in vain to extinguish them, the enemy never ceased to send showers of arrows among the unfortunate men, so that many of them lost their lives. Although the Tyrians had destroyed the work of months, Alexander still refused to give in. He now sent to the cities round about, and bade them send the ships to guard his soldiers until the causeway was finished. In seven months, from the time it was begun, the causeway reached to the foot of the rock on which the city stood. In July 332 BC, a breach was made in the wall, and, led by Alexander himself, the Macedonians rushed in triumph into the city that had so long defied them. The Tyrians fought fiercely, for they knew they need not look for mercy if the city was taken. But they were soon overpowered, and the town was given up to plunder. The soldiers were eager for spoil, but spoil alone could not satisfy them. As they thought of the weary months which they had spent in trying to reach the island, they wreaked their rage on the miserable citizens, massacring all on whom they could lay their hands. After Tyre had fallen, Alexander was master of Syria, and could control the eastern Mediterranean. From Tyr, the king marched southward until he reached Egypt. Here, after making himself lord of the country, he founded the city which is still called after him, Alexandria. During the siege of Tyr, Darius had again sent to Alexander, offering to him a large ransom for his family, as well as the hand of his daughter, and all the provinces west of Euphrates. While Alexander and his generals were talking over the offer of Darius, Parmenio exclaimed, If I were you, I should accept these terms. And I, answered the king, would accept them if I were Parmenio. To Darius, Alexander's reply was haughtier than ever. If thou comest, so ran his words, and yield thyself up into my power, I will treat thee with all possible kindness. If not, I will come myself to seek thee. Soon after this, the wife of Darius died. Alexander had always treated her well, and now he buried her with great honor. One of her servants fled to Darius to tell him the sad tidings. He told him, too, of the kindness Alexander had ever shown to his royal captive. "'O king,' said the servant, "'neither your queen, when alive, nor your mother, nor children, wanted anything of their former happy condition, unless it were the light of your countenance. And after her decease, Statira, the queen, had not only all due funeral ornaments, but was honored also with the tears of your very enemies.' for Alexander is as gentle after victory as he is terrible in the field. End of chapter 96 Chapter 97 of The Story of Greece, Told to Boys and Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Elizabeth Horan, The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor, The Battle of Gogamela. It was now almost two years since the Battle of Issus, and Alexander determined once more to meet Darius, who had again assembled a large army. In the spring of 331 BC, the king went back to Tyre, and by August he had reached Thapsacus, a town on the banks of the river Euphrates. He wished to go on to Babylon, the capital of the Persian Empire, but the direct way to the city, which was down the Euphrates, was guarded by Cyrus with a large army. So Alexander struck off across the north Mesopotamia, and reaching the Tigris, marched along the river on the eastern side. Above Nineveh, he crossed to the other bank, and after marching southward for several days, he heard that Darius was encamped on a plain near Gogamela, on the river Bumodus. Even to the brave Macedonian generals, the vast hosts of the Persians, looked formidable. Parmenio, looking at them, begged the king to surprise the enemy by a night attack, rather than risk a battle in daylight. "'I will not steal a victory,' answered Alexander. 
The night before the battle, the king slept soundly, as though nothing preyed upon his mind. In the morning, his generals found him still fast asleep, so without disturbing him, they themselves bade the soldiers have breakfast. At length, Parmenio went to wake the king, and having with difficulty roused him, he asked how it was possible he could sleep so soundly when the most important battle of his life had to be fought that day. "'You slept, sire, as though you were already victorious,' said the anxious general. "'Are we not so indeed?' answered the king, "'since we are at last relieved from the trouble of wandering in pursuit of Darius through a wide and wasted country, hoping in vain that he would fight us.' Alexander, who was already dressed, now put on his helmet, which was of iron, yet so polished was it that it shone as silver. Great skill had been lavished on the decoration of his belt, which was indeed the most splendid part of his dress. He then ordered his army to be drawn up in battle array, while he mounted Bucephalus, who was old now, yet eager for battle. Before the king gave the signal to attack, he stretched out his right hand to heaven, and called upon the gods to defend and strengthen the Greeks, if he indeed were the son of Zeus. By the side of Alexander rode a soothsayer, clad in a white robe and wearing on his head a crown of gold. He pointed to the sky, and the soldiers looking up saw an eagle flying over the king's head and on toward the Persian army. It is a good omen, they cried, and shouted to be led at once against the foe. A moment later the order was given, and the Macedonians rushed upon the great hosts of the enemy. Darius thought that his war chariots would cause deadly havoc among his enemies, for scythes were fastened to the wheels to mow down all who came within reach. But the Macedonian archers drew their bows and sped their arrows among the charioteers, while the strongest seized the reins of the horses and pulled the drivers from their seats. Then the soldiers opened wide their ranks, so that those chariots that still had drivers rattled harmlessly past them. Alexander was already attacking the center of the Persian army, where, as at the Battle of Issus, Darius sat in his chariot, looking on at the struggle. All at once he saw Alexander with his chosen companions drawing nearer and nearer, and once again his courage failed. Fiercer and fiercer raged the battle, closer and closer drew Alexander to the Persian king. The horsemen grouped in front of Darius were driven backward and fled, all save the bravest, who never flinched, but fell in a supreme effort to keep the enemy from approaching any nearer to the king's chariot. Even as they fell, they still tried to keep back the foe, clinging desperately to the legs of the horses as they galloped over their wounded bodies. Darius was in immediate danger of being captured. In vain, the driver tried to turn the royal chariot. The bodies of the fallen soldiers would not allow the wheels to move. The horses plunged and kicked in an agony of fear, and the charioteer was helpless. Then, as the king had done on the field of Issus, he did now. He leaped from the chariot, mounted a horse, and fled from the battlefield. Alexander followed the king in swift pursuit. It seemed impossible that he could escape. But Parmenio, who was commanding the left wing, was almost overpowered by the enemy. He sent a messenger to overtake Alexander and beg him for help. The king reluctantly gave up his pursuit of Darius and rode back with his companions to give his general the help he had entreated. But by the time he reached the left wing, his aid was no longer needed. Parmenio had wrested victory from the foe. So the king again set out in pursuit of Darius, but all that he captured was the chariot, the shield, and the bow of the coward king. End of chapter 97「Section 98 of The Story of Greece Told to Boys and Girls」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor Alexander Burns Persepolis The Battle of Gagamela in 331 BC decided the fate of the Persian Empire. Darius was no longer the great king, for Alexander took the title as well as the dominions of his foe. At Babylon, to which city Alexander now marched, the gates were thrown open to welcome him, the people coming out to meet the conqueror, led by their priests. Alexander received them kindly, and bade the Babylonians not be afraid still to worship their own national god. Here, in this great city, 
the king dreamed that he would set up his throne. Babylon should be the capital of his new empire. Not far from Babylon was the city of Susa, where the Persian kings usually spent the winter months. Susa also surrendered to the great king without a blow being struck. There were many treasures and much gold in both Babylon and Susa. Perhaps the most wonderful treasure was a piece of purple cloth, which was worth an enormous sum of money. Although it had been laid aside for 190 years, yet its marvelous color was as perfect as it had ever been. The spoils for which the Greeks cared most were some that had been carried away by Xerxes. Among those they found at Susa were statues of Harmodius and Aristogeton. By the order of Alexander, they were now sent back to Athens. But even greater treasures than any the king had yet found were stored in palaces hidden among the highlands of Persia. To these places, Alexander resolved to march, although the way led through narrow mountain passes which were guarded by a Persian army. By attacking the enemy, both in the front and in the rear, Alexander caught the Persians in a trap. They were speedily cut to pieces or fell down the dangerous mountain tracks in a vain effort to escape. Then, unhindered by any foe, the king marched to one of the great cities of the Persian kings, which the Greeks called Persepolis, or the richest of all cities under the sun. So great were the treasures stored in the palace of Persepolis, that ten thousand pairs of mules and five thousand camels were needed to carry them away. For four months, Alexander lingered in the city. His soldiers were proud indeed of their king when for the first time they saw him sitting under a canopy of gold on the throne of the Persian monarchs. A Corinthian, who was a great friend of Alexander's, exclaimed at the sight, How unfortunate are those Greeks who have died without beholding Alexander seated on the throne of Darius! Before he left Persepolis to go in search of Darius, Alexander gave a great feast. It was then that the king, urged by the excited revelers, allowed the palace to be burned. With a wreath of flowers on his head and a lighted torch in his hand, the king, followed by his guests, surrounded the palace and set light to it. The soldiers also seized torches, and amid shouts and merriment they too helped to destroy the palace of the Persian kings. The Macedonians thought that the burning of the palace was a sign that Alexander did not mean to dwell among the barbarians, and they rejoiced, for they were growing weary of marching into unknown countries, and they were beginning to think wistfully of their homeland. Alexander was soon sorry for the wild impulse which had seized him, and he gave orders to put out the fire as speedily as might be. The officers in Alexander's army had become rich with the spoils of conquered cities, and the king found that they were growing as fond of ease and luxury as the Persians. Their tables were loaded with delicacies, servants attended to their slightest wish. One officer even had his shoes made with silver nails. Such indulgence annoyed the king, and he reproved his officers, telling them that toil was more honorable than pleasure. How is it possible, he said? If you cannot attend to your own body, that you look well after your horse, or keep your armor bright and in good order. You should surely avoid the weaknesses of those you have conquered. To set his army an example, the king now began to hunt more than was his custom, and with less care for his own safety. When the soldiers were sent against an enemy, Alexander himself went with them, and endured the same hardships and dangers as his men. End of section 98 Chapter 99 of The Story of Greece, Told to Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. January 12, 2022, Westford, Massachusetts. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. Alexander slays his foster brother. Early in 330 BC, Alexander left Persepolis to go in search of Darius. After a long and difficult march of 300 miles, to which his soldiers took only 11 days, the king heard that Darius had passed the defile called the Caspian Gates. For five days he allowed his men, who were utterly exhausted, to rest before he again started in pursuit of the fugitive. 
After passing through the Caspian gates, Alexander heard that Bessus, a kinsman of Darius, who was also his officer or satrap, had made him a prisoner. Loaded with chains, Darius was being carried away to the district over which Bessus ruled. This made the king the more determined to reach the unfortunate captive. For four days he hurried on until at length he reached a village where Bessus and his men had stayed the evening before. He was told that the satrap was going to make a forced march that night. The king learned of a shorter road by which he might overtake the fugitives, but there was no water to be found on the way. Alexander did not hesitate. With only a small company, he set out the same evening, and when morning dawned, he had ridden 45 miles. The fugitives were now within sight. When the barbarians who were with Bessus saw the king in the distance, they fled. The satrap quickly took the chains off his captive, bidding him mount a horse and follow them. When Darius refused, he stabbed him and rode away, leaving the wretched king to die or to fall into the hands of his enemy. A few Macedonians who were riding in front of the king reached the wounded man first and gave him water, for which he begged. Darius then lay back, and before Alexander arrived, he had breathed his last. The king looked at his fallen foe with pity and then flung over him his own cloak. His body he sent to the queen mother, that it might be buried beside the other Persian kings at Persepolis. Bessus was betrayed into the hands of Alexander not long afterwards. Naked and chained, he was placed on the road by which Alexander's army must pass. The king stopped when he reached the satrap and asked him why he had murdered Darius, who had always treated him well. Bessus answered that he did it to win Alexander's favor. His reply won no pity from the king, who ordered him to be scourged and sent to prison. Some time after, he was brought to trial and sentenced to a cruel death. Until now, Alexander had lived almost as simply as when he was a lad, and but lately he had reproved his officers for their indolent and luxurious habits. Now he gradually began to adopt the customs of the East. He dressed in purple and surrounded himself with Persian courtiers and acted as though he was indeed a descendant of the gods. The Macedonians were quick to take offense at the favor their king showed to the Persians. Philotas, a son of Parmenio, resented the king's deeds more perhaps than any other of his generals. He was proud and his haughty ways had made his men dislike him. Parmenio would sometimes say to him, My son, to be not quite so great would be better. But Philetus would take no notice of the rebuke. One day he declared that but for him and his father, the king would never have conquered Asia. Yet it is he, the boy Alexander, who enjoys the glory of the victories and the title of king, said the foolish officer. Alexander was told of the boastful way in which Philetus had spoken, but he neither reproved nor punished him. A little later, a plot was made against his life, and Philetus, who would not allow those who wished to warn the king to enter his presence. Then Alexander, who knew of this also, ordered Philetus to be seized and imprisoned. He was tried before an assembly of Macedonians and confessed that he had known of the plot to kill the king and yet had neither warned him nor allowed others to do so. The Macedonians condemned him to death and themselves carried out the sentence, throwing at him their javelins. Alexander had been patient with Philetus, and his punishment was just, but now the king did a cruel deed for thinking that his old and faithful general, Parmenio, might have shared in the treachery of his son, he sent a messenger to slay him. The king's dispatch was taken to Parmenio and put into his hand. As he began to read it, he was stabbed in the back. From this time, the king's temper grew less and less controlled. At one of the royal feasts, he lost it altogether. 
A guest sang a song which made a jest of some Macedonians who had been beaten by the Persians. The old soldiers were indignant, the more so that Alexander paid no heed to their anger and bade the singer sing on. Clitus, the king's foster brother, had a quick temper, and he cried out, it is not well done to expose the Macedonians before their enemies, since though it was their unhappiness to be overcome, yet are they much better men than those who laugh at them. Clitus pleads his own cause, said the king, when he names cowardice misfortune. The king spoke half in jest, half in anger, for he knew well that Clitus and all his Macedonians were brave and no cowards. But Clitus sprang to his feet at Alexander's words and cried, Yet, O king, it was my cowardice that once saved your life from the Persians, and it is by the wounds of Macedonians that you are now the great king. Speak not so boldly, answered the king, and in his voice there was a threat or think not you will long enjoy the power to do so. Clitus was now too angry to care what he said, and he spoke to the king yet more bitterly, until Alexander could brook no more. He took an apple from the table before him, and flinging it at his foster brother, felt for his sword. But one of his guards, foreseeing what might happen, had removed it. His guests now gathered around the king, trying to soothe his anger. Alexander pushed them aside and ordered one of his guard to sound the alarm. This would have assembled the whole army, and the man hesitated, whereupon Alexander struck him on the face. Meanwhile, a friend had hurried Clitus out of the room, but he slipped back again by another door and boldly taunted the king with the way in which he treated his old soldiers. Then, in a passion, Alexander snatched a spear from one of his guards, rushed upon Clitus, and stabbed him to death. A moment later, the king's anger faded away, and he looked in horror upon the dead body of his foster brother. He seized the spear again and tried to kill himself, but his guards wrenched it away and led him to his own room. There he lay all through the long night and all through the following day, weeping for his foster brother, whom he had slain. End of chapter 99。Chapter 100 of the Story of Greece, told to boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mary Balmer. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. Porus and His Elephant. The Macedonians had now for some time been longing to march homeward rather than into new and unknown lands. But Alexander's ambition was not yet satisfied, and in 327 B.C. he determined to march into India, to add that land also to his conquests. The army was laden with booty, and the king saw that unless it were left behind, the men would not be able to march. It would be no easy matter to make the soldiers give up their plunder. But Alexander knew well how to manage men. He ordered all his own share of plunder, all his unnecessary clothing, almost all his ornaments to be burned. His courtiers did as they saw their king do, and when the soldiers were ordered to follow Alexander's example, they did so without a murmur, while some even cheered. Without the plunder, the soldiers marched easily, and soon reached the Punjab, where the king of the district brought to Alexander's aid 5,000 men. The army marched on unopposed until it came to the river Hadaspes, or, as we call it now, the Jalem. Here it was forced to halt, for on the opposite bank was a powerful Indian king named Porus and a large army. 
Horus had with him a number of elephants, and when they trumpeted, the horses of the Macedonians took flight. The banks of the river were slippery, and the enemy was ready with arrows, should the king order his army to cross the river. Alexander had made up his mind to cross the Hydaspes, but first he wished to put Porus off his guard. So, night after night, by the king's orders, a trumpet called the cavalry to march. It advanced always to the edge of the river, while Porus, thinking the whole army was going to cross, commanded his elephants to be moved to the bank, and his great hosts to be drawn up ready for battle. Hour after hour the Indians waited, but the Macedonians never attempted to cross. And so they grew listless and each night less vigilant. Even Porus began to think the Macedonians must be cowards, and he paid less and less attention to their movements. This was what Alexander had expected would happen. But one stormy night, when the Indians were off their guard, the king, with part of his army, crossed to a wooded island that lay in the middle of the river. It was a terrible night. Lightning flashed, thunder crashed, and several of Alexander's men were killed as they struggled breast high in the water. With great difficulty, the others reached the farther side to find that Porus had realized his danger. A thousand horsemen and sixty armed chariots awaited the daring king. But Alexander captured the chariots and slew four hundred of the cavalry. The whole Macedonian army had now joined the king, and a desperate battle was fought. Hour after hour the conflict raged, neither side gaining the victory. At length, when the elephants were dead or their riders slain, when the Indians were flying in every direction, Porus knew that the day was lost. Yet he disdained to flee and fought on, seated upon an elephant of enormous size, for he himself was more than six feet in height. Only when he was wounded in his shoulder did he turn to ride away from the field. It is told that while the battle was raging, the elephant took the greatest care of his master. And when the animal saw that the king was faint from his wounds, he knelt down carefully that Porus might not fall. Then, with his trunk, he drew out the darts that were left in the body of the king. Alexander had seen how bravely his enemy had fought. As he watched him riding from the field, he thought he would like to speak with so great a warrior, and he sent to ask him to return. He himself went out to meet the king and was amazed at his great height and at his beauty. When Alexander asked Porus how he wished to be treated, he answered, As a king. For my own sake I will do that, replied the great king. Ask a boon for thy sake. That, said Porus, containeth all. As was his way, Alexander treated the fallen king right royally, giving back to him his kingdom and adding to it new territories. Two cities were built close to the battlefield. One was named Bucephala, after Alexander's famous horse, which, some say, was wounded and died after the battle. But others tell that Bucephalus had died shortly before the battle of old age, for he had lived for thirty years. The king grieved for the loss of his noble steed as for the loss of a friend. This terrible battle made the Macedonians still more unwilling to advance farther into India. Before them lay a desert, which would take eleven days to cross. The soldiers could not face a long march in a strange land, without water and without guides. 
when Alexander ordered the army to advance. The Macedonians who had followed him loyally through every difficulty refused to obey. Nothing he could say would make them advance a step farther. There they stood, looking hard at the ground, with tears trickling down their cheeks, yet resolute still not to go forward. Then Alexander dismissed them in anger, but the next day he sent for them again and told them that he was going to advance. They, if they chose to forsake him in a hostile land, could go back to Macedon. Still in anger, the king left them and went to his tent and shut himself up for two days, refusing to see any of his companions. Perhaps he thought his obstinate Macedonians would yield, but although it grieved them to thwart their king, the soldiers remained firm. On the third day, Alexander left his tent and offered sacrifices to the gods, as he always did before beginning a new adventure. But the signs were unfavorable, and against this the king was not proof. So he sent to tell the army that he had determined to lead them in the direction of home. In a transport of joy, the faithful Macedonians hastened to the king's tent. Some of them wept as they thanked the unconquered king that he had permitted himself to be conquered for once by his Macedonians. End of chapter 100section 101 of the story of greece told to boys and girls this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the story of greece by mary mcgregor alexander is wounded alexander determined to begin the homeward journey by sailing down the hydaspes and the indus in order to reach the ocean the king himself, with part of the army, embarked in the ships which awaited them on the Hydaspes. The rest of the army was divided into two companies, and marched on either bank of the river, one being under Hephaestion, the king's friend. On the way the fleet and the army joined their forces in order to subdue some of the warlike tribes that refused to submit to them. One of these tribes, the Mali, Alexander pursued to their chief city, which stood where the town of Moulton has since been built. The city was easily taken, but not so the citadel, in which the Mali had taken refuge. Before the walls surrounding it could be scaled, ladders were needed, and two were hurriedly brought to the spot. But it was difficult to place them in position, for the Mali hurled upon the soldiers every missile on which they could lay their hands. Alexander, growing impatient, seized one of the ladders, and covering himself with his shield, he placed it in position and began to mount. Pusestus, carrying the sacred shield of Troy, and Leonidas, two of his companions, followed closely after their king, while Abraeus began to climb the second ladder, which was now also ready for use. The king was soon standing alone on the top of the wall, having flung down those of the Mali who were keeping guard at that point. In despair, the Macedonians saw the danger to which their king had exposed himself. He was a mark for every weapon hurled from the citadel. They rushed in a body to the ladders, and began to mount in such numbers that the ladders both gave way, Pusestus, Leonidas, and Abraeus alone having first reached the top of the wall. His friends called aloud to Alexander, entreating him to come back. But he leapt down on the other side among his foes. Fortunately, he landed on his feet, and at once placing his back against the wall, he strove to keep back the enemy as they rushed upon him. The foremost fell before the swift stroke of the king's sword, as did also those who followed him. At two more the king hurled stones, which felled them to the ground. After that the Mali were afraid to approach close to the great king, but they began to throw at him stones and great pieces of rock. A moment later his three companions had leapt down and were by the side of their king, 
ready to defend him with their lives. Abreus fell at his feet almost at once, pierced by a dart. Alexander himself was wounded, but fought on until at length, faint through loss of blood, he fell fainting on his shield. Pusestus covered him with the sacred shield, while Leonidas fought on desperately until help came. A few of the Macedonians, maddened by the thought of their king's danger, scrambled up on each other's shoulders, and leapt down on the other side to rescue him and his three companions if they still lived. Some ran to the gates and opened them, and the anxious soldiers poured in and took the citadel. They believed that their king was dead, and they wrecked their fury on the miserable inhabitants, leaving neither men, women, nor children alive. Alexander was not dead, and although his wound was severe, he recovered. But the rumor of his death had reached the camp, near the river, where the main body of the army had been left. No letters, no messages, could make the grief-stricken soldiers believe that their king still lived. Alexander was brought down the river in a ship. He was lying on a couch in the stern of the vessel as he drew near to the camp, and he ordered the canopy, which screened him, to be raised, that his soldiers might see him. At first they thought it was but his lifeless body which they beheld, but as he drew nearer still, the king waved his hand. Then a great shout of joy rent the air. End of section 101「Section 102 of the Story of Greece Told to Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Alex Steele. The Story of Greece by Mary MacGregor. The Death of Alexander. In the autumn of 325 B.C., Alexander began to march through the desert of Gedrosia on his way to Babylon. The heat was terrible, and the soldiers were soon parched with thirst, while sinking sand added to the hardship of the march. Alexander tramped by the side of his men across the dreary waste, sharing all their privations and cheering them by his presence. But before he left the desert of Gedrosia, the king had lost more than a fourth part of the army that had set out with him from India two short months before. At length, the exhausted soldiers reached Susa, and here the king allowed them to rest. He himself found much to do, for many of the satraps, whom he had left in charge of different provinces, had betrayed their trust. They had treated cruelly those who were in their power and had formed plots to make themselves kings over their own provinces. It may be that they thought Alexander would never come back from his perilous journey in the east. When he had punished those who had proved faithless, were they Macedonians or Persians, he turned to a matter on which his heart was set, the union of the peoples of the east and the west. The king tried to accomplish this in different ways, he had already built cities in the east, and left in them Greeks and Macedonians, along with the native Asiatics. Now he himself wedded Statyra, the daughter of Darius. Hephaestion married her sister, while several Macedonian generals, following the example of the king, took the daughters of Persian nobles to be their wives. Many of the soldiers, too, married women of the east. Alexander hoped that, little by little, the two races would learn to know each other better and to have the same interests. In the spring of 324 BC, Alexander went to Ecbatana, where the Persian kings had been used to spend the summer months. Shortly afterwards, he met his whole army at Opus, not far from Babylon, and discharged many of the Macedonian veterans who were no longer fit to fight because of old age or because of the wounds from which they had suffered. The king promised to provide for these old warriors for the rest of their lives. He expected them to welcome their dismissal and their reward. But the Macedonians had been growing more and more jealous of the favors Alexander had been showing to the Persians, and now the feelings that they had been forced to hide found words. 
they bade the king discharge not only the veterans, but his loyal Macedonians. Some even dared to shout, Go and conquer with Zeus, your father. The king, in sudden anger, sprang from his seat, down among the angry throng, and ordered thirteen of the ringleaders to be put to death. He then bade the others go away if they wished. They had been only poor shepherds on the hills of Macedon, he reminded them, until his father Philip had made them rulers of Greece. He had shared with them the wealth of the East and had kept nothing for himself save his purple robe and his royal diadem. Alexander then went to his palace, and in three days he sent for the Persian nobles, to whom he gave the posts of honor, which until now had been held by the Macedonians. Plutarch tells us that when the Macedonians, who had stayed in their quarters in spite of their dismissal, heard what Alexander had done, they went without their arms, with only their undergarments on, crying and weeping, to offer themselves at his tent and desired him to deal with them as their baseness and ingratitude deserved. Yet he would not admit them to his presence, nor would they stir from thence, but continued two days and nights before his tent, bewailing themselves, and imploring him as their lord to have compassion on them. But on the third day he came out to them, and seeing them very humble and penitent, he wept himself a great while after a gentle reproof spoke kindly to them, and dismissed those who were too old for service with magnificent rewards, and with recommendation to Antipater that when they came home, at all public shows and in the theaters, they should sit in the best and foremost seats, crowned with chaplets of flowers. During the summer which he spent at Ecbatana, a great sorrow befell the king. Hephaestion, his dearest friend, took ill, and in seven days he was dead. For three days the king would touch no food. No one could comfort him, for well the king knew that no one would ever fill the place that Hephaestion had held in his heart. The body of his friend the king ordered to be taken to Babylon, where it was burnt on a pyre adorned with great magnificence. Chapels were built in his honor in Alexandria and other cities. In June 323 B.C., a month after the funeral rites, Alexander, who was preparing for a great expedition by sea, went to the river Euphrates to inspect some new harbors which he had ordered to be built. The place was unhealthy because of the many marshes that lay round about the river, and the king was attacked by fever. He refused to take any care, and daily he grew worse, until at length, he was forced by weakness to stay in bed. A rumor that he was dead reached the Macedonians, and they hastened to the palace, begging to be allowed to see their king once more. Alexander was not dead, but was too weak to speak, as one by one the soldiers were permitted to walk quietly past his bed. With an effort, he looked at them as they passed, and feebly raised his hand in farewell. After I am gone... Will you ever find a king worthy of such heroes as these? He murmured as they slowly filed out of the room. Then he drew his signet ring from his finger and gave it to an officer, saying that he left his kingdom to the best man. So the great king passed away at the age of 33. End of section 102「Chapter 103 of the Story of Greece, told to boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mary Balmer. The Story of Greece by Mary McGregor. Demosthenes in the Temple of Poseidon. When Alexander set out on his great expedition to Asia, Demosthenes was living in Athens, and for five years nothing happened to disturb the quiet habits of his life. He loved his city well, and with his own money he had rebuilt the walls of Athens. Many other services he had done for his countrymen, 
and because of these, one of the Athenians proposed to the people that a hero's crown of gold should be bestowed upon Demosthenes. This they were very willing to do. So at one of the great Athenian festivals, when the people were assembled in the theater, a herald proclaimed that a golden crown had been awarded to the orator because of all that he had done for his city. But Escanes, another great orator, was angry that this honor should have been given to Demosthenes, whom he happened to dislike. So he brought a lawsuit against him and attacked his enemy in a speech that became famous. But Demosthenes defended himself in a still more brilliant speech and won his case, which so annoyed Escanes that he left Athens and never again returned to the city. Six years later, Demosthenes was accused of having taken bribes. It was not proved that he had done so, yet he was found guilty and sentenced to pay a heavy fine. As he had not money enough to pay the fine, he was thrown into prison. Before long he escaped and fled to the seacoast town of Aegina, not far from Athens. Often he would sit on the shore or pace up and down the sands, looking wistfully toward the city he loved. When tidings of the death of Alexander reached Athens, the Greeks resolved once more to try to fling off the yoke of Macedon. Demosthenes was recalled to the city, and his voice encouraged the Athenians in their determination to fight for liberty. But Antipater hastened to Attica with an army, and soon put down the revolt of the Athenians. He then condemned Demosthenes to death, for it was well known that his Philippics had often roused the Athenians to show their hatred of Philip, and he had, too, continually spoken against his son Alexander. When Demosthenes heard that he had been condemned, he fled to the temple of Poseidon in the island of Calaria. Antipater at once sent soldiers, led by a man named Archias, to capture the fugitive. Archias had once been an actor and was well known to Demosthenes. Archias reached Calaria and, going to the temple, he begged Demosthenes to come out of the sanctuary, saying that if he did so, he would be pardoned. But Demosthenes knew that this was a false promise, and he said, O oh, Archias, I am as little affected by your promises now as I used formerly to be by your acting. Now Archias had been proud of his acting, so this made him very angry with Demosthenes, and he began to threaten him with all kinds of evil. Now, said the orator, you speak like an oracle of Macedon, before you were acting a part. Therefore, wait only a little, while I write a word or two to my family. Then he rose and went into the inner temple, and taking a tablet and his own pen in his hand, he sat down as though to write. He had a habit of putting his pen into his mouth and biting it, and he did so now. It seemed as though he was thinking what he would write, but all the while he was sucking poison, which he had concealed in his pen. Then, knowing that the poison would soon do its work, Demosthenes leaned on the altar, his face hidden in his cloak. Archias had now grown tired of waiting, and he went into the temple again and bade Demosthenes come without more delay. The orator rose, uncovering his head, and looking at Archias, he said, I will depart while I am alive out of this sacred place. But as he tried to walk toward the door, he staggered and fell by the altar. The poison had done its work. Antipater had no interest in the art or in the culture of Greece, and her glory soon faded under his rule. Athens, Sparta, Corinth, as well as the smaller states, all ceased to be independent. As the power of Greece grew less, that of Rome was growing greater and greater, 
In 196 BC, she conquered Macedon and restored to Greece her liberty. Fifty years later, Corinth defied the Roman power and treated her ambassadors with insult. The Roman consuls then sent an army into Greece to conquer the country and add it to their great dominions. But although the Romans conquered Greece and so made her subject to them, they could not escape her influence. The Greek language was spoken by every educated Roman. Greek plays were acted at Rome. Greek literature was read and studied. Wherever the Romans went, they carried with them the habits and the culture of the people whom they had conquered. And the greatest and most precious thing the Greeks had to teach the world was the just consideration of the truth of things everywhere. End of chapter 103 End of the Story of Greece Told to Boys and Girls by Mary McGregor